பாண்டிச்சேரி இருக்கேஷன் நீங்களா டாக்ஸ் என்ன மேக்கப் பண்ணாச்சு இங்க நான் பட்ட மாதிரி ஐ டூ ஐ டூ சஃபரிங் फ्रॉम ஸ்பியர் ரெஸ்பிரேட் இன்ஃபெක්ෂன் 3 டேஸ் இப்போ கூட ஜஸ்ட் ஐ ஹேட் நெபுலைசர் ஆச்சு பைப் ஜஸ்ட் இஸ் பட் ரேப் பட் இப்போ 7:00 கிளாக் மீட்டிங் அட் காரைக்குடி அத இது ஆரம்பிச்சிட்டு அப்படியே இதெல்லாம் போற கார்ல போயும்போது சம்டைம் சிக்னல் கட் ஆகலாம் இந்த பா நீங்க நீங்க ஜஸ்ட் கேக்கு சார் என்ன <laughs> செய்ய <laughs> 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 இங்க ஹோட்டல் இருக்கீங்களா சார் ராஜேந்திரன் ஆமா சார்
Darshani. Hello? Sir? Start from the language. Ah, yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening to everybody on behalf of IAP Team SCI. Uh, welcome, uh, one and all, for this um, CME on Pediatric Dermatology. Uh, I welcome our uh, president, uh, Dr. Amish Babu, and uh, Dr. Kopal Subramaniam Treserer, and uh, program convener, Dr. Um, R. V. Dashaini, is editor, and chairperson, Dr. M. Singaravela, uh, Sir uh, Tanjavur, and uh, all the speakers, um, Dr. Madhu from uh, Chennai, Dr. Murugu Sundaram from Chennai, Dr. Karthiyan from Pondicherry, Dr. Roshni Menon, Menon from Pondicherry, as well as Dr. S. Deva Prabha uh, from Madurai. I welcome all the central <coughs> EP members uh, and as well as state EP members. I welcome Dr. Aram Sendil sir, who is uh, here with me. And uh, I welcome uh, Joint uh, Secretary, Dr. Pasta Parmani also. And uh, this, uh, uh, now I, uh, I welcome Dr. M. Uh, Singaravali sir to participate. Good evening to all. Respected President Dr. Ramesh Babu, our ever dynamic secretary who has been continuously doing a great academic work during this COVID time and still continuing, Professor Dr. Rajendran, and uh, ever smiling youngster, Professor Dashayani, who is arranging very good program to all our practicing pediatrician and all the members of Central IAP and all the delegates. The speakers of today's uh, dermatology, the topics are so designed in such a way that the practicing pediatrician, however many times we hear about uh, skin infection in children, especially fungal infections and other atopic dermatitis, several meeting, every conference we discuss, still we have confusions. And this time, the topics are aligned in such a way that it will be very useful for next two hours. All of us can have a very good academic feast about day-to-day -day practice in dermatological problems. The topics are very well. And the speakers are known to me very well. Dr. Karthigayan, one of the pioneer who is doing extensive work. Uh, he is from Manaklama Medical College uh, from, and Dr. Madhu and others all very good speakers. We welcome on behalf of our IAP. And I thank our team for giving me this opportunity to chair this program. Thank you. We will see as the program goes on, you all will be benefited much about it. Thank you, sir. Thank you for Thank you, sir. Sir, now I request our Central EP member, Dr. Aram Sedil, sir, to tell a few words. I welcome Anbu Vanakam. Uh, this topic is uh, really uh, going to be uh, the breadwinner for most pediatricians because the first contact for anyone is the pediatrician. So uh, we will learn from our pediatric dermatologist colleagues today. Let us have a wonderful learning experience. Thank you for all the uh, convener, the faculty, and Dr. Singar Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. And now uh, I request uh, Dr. Dashani to state uh, and take our place. Dashani, why is well? Hello, can you hear me? So, so am I audible, sir? Ah, yes, no uh, audible, ma'am. Oh, no yes, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, at the outset, I would like to thank IAP uh, Tamil Nadu State Chapter, the office bearers, for this uh, opportunity and uh, for interesting me with this job of convening this uh, CME. And uh, to start with, uh, I thought it would be very uh, kind of easy to get things done, but uh, the work wasn't all that easy. Uh, 
<laughs> and uh, my hearty thanks to our uh, chairperson dr singar velu sir who immediately uh, obliged every time i ask him for some favor he uh, promptly says yes i've never gotten a no from him thank you so much and um, hearty thanks to our president uh, ramesh babu sir uh, our uh, secretary dr uh, rajendran sir treasurer and uh, central iipb member our past president dr aram chandel sir Uh, they've always trusted me and uh, like they've always let me go with whatever i have wanted to and special thanks to dr thiru sir so uh, for making all these arrangements in a very short uh, span of time and i my heartfelt thanks to all the speakers for having uh, agreed to do this at this busy uh, sunday because uh, it's been like always batch meets and uh, this meet or the other happening every time even our chat person said he had a Uh, see me to attend this between seven and nine and all that. So in this busy uh, time and this busy period of the year, they have agreed to do such a um, useful see me for the pediatricians, and it is always like uh, dermatology has always been a part it uh, of uh, practicing pediatricians. We always think it is. Uh, I mean, it might as well. Uh, go along with our uh, management, but it is not that all the time. So. it is always the specialist that we look up to when we end up in a crisis or even at the start of a, a diagnosing and treating difficult conditions so dermatologists have always been in close liaison with the pediatrician so this uh, topic i think would uh, definitely benefit all the pediatricians and we have chosen topics in such a way that it uh, covers all the a uh, practical aspects of uh, dermatology and uh, without much further ado i would uh, like to invite the first speaker um, my teacher professor dr madhu madam who's the associate professor of uh, dermatology at the uh, at uh, madras medical college okay shears barak sir ma'am am i audible ma'am yes 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 good evening Good evening. I'll I'll just share my screen now. Ah uh, yes, ma'am. Professor Dr. Madhu has a uh, is a PG teacher and uh, she's got lots of uh, publications to her credit and uh, she's a reviewer of uh, Indian Journal of Dermatology and the Indian Journal of Practical Pediatrics. Ah uh, and uh, she's reviewed uh, many articles. Her interest, uh, special interest, include. uh medical mycology and pediatric dermatology she is a pediatrician herself and presently she holds the post of uh, secretary of iap dermatology chapter and um, she was formerly the chairperson of iadvl task force against recalcitrant uh, tinea she's been awarded the best doctor award uh, when she was working in gaman stanley uh, medical college as an associate professor of the department of dermatology she is very close to all of us uh, she has got a very sweet demeanor so she never says no to whatever we ask her for i am so happy and uh, personally feel uh, uh, elated to uh, have madam amitstress thank you ma'am uh, over to you for the talk good evening everyone respected senior members and dear friends Now, uh, thank you for your kind words of appreciation, Dr. Daksh. I mean, it's always been very nice to be in close association with all of you. It pleasures mine too. Uh, well, yeah, and at the outset, I would like to thank uh, for the opportunity, thank the organizing committee of this particular CME and the convener and the chairperson, and uh, for giving a talk on yet another topic that is very close to my heart: the fungal infections. Now, so just to begin, let us recapitulate about our classification of fungal infections. we all know that it can be classified as superficial and deep and the deep mycosis get classified as subcutaneous and systemic with systemic becomes endemic and opportunistic infections what is relevant for us when we talk about fungal infections in children is most often we see superficial fungal infections and among the superficial lung fungal infections again it is dermatophytosis which tops the list followed by pityriasis versicolor and candidiasis now candidiasis again can be localized and we know that it's an opportunity fungal infection as well and in those immunocompromised children we will be seeing the disseminated candidiasis and among the superficial fungal infections the deep fungal infections we have the subcutaneous fungal infections and these two residue bolo mycosis and pyo hypomycosis is something which we might see we will talk about it a little later actually 
and uh, these days when we have more and more number of children with uh, with uh, who get admitted in icu for a long time or it could be again because of uh, connective tissue disorders or it could be because of leukemias we do see invasive fungal infections like mucormycosis and aspergillosis and in hiv children cryptococcus as aspergillus well. but for want of time i will focus on the most common four fungal fungal infections dermatophytosis as i already told you tops the list that we say the i mean see in our day to day office practice actually and these are caused by dermatophytes which can be anthropophilic that is you know human to human transmission and zoophilic is from animal to human transmission and geophilic is when the children of course play in the soil and then acquire the infection and of course it all gets transmitted through direct contact or through fomites as well and uh, normally when we talk about dermatophytosis in children couple of years back maybe 7 to 8 years back when you say dermatophytosis in children it was synonymous almost with the word tinea capitis because tinea capitis that is the infection of the scalp and the scalp hair was the most common fungal infection seen in children and occasionally we might see a patch or two of tinea corporis over the waist region of the groin of the children because when these infants get carried by the a mother or the grandmother who tend to have a tinea corporis in the waist so that was all it was about but last 7 years i would say probably almost 6 to 7 years now there has been an increase in the incidence of dermatophytosis of the glabrous skin among the adults in india and uh, there have been multiple factors related to this starting from the global warming to the steroid abuse and this steroid abuse practically what is being used by the adults themselves they were using it for the children as well and uh, so we do see an increase in incidence of dermatophytosis among the children as well and it is just not children it is even the neonates and infants and young toddlers also and just an infection a dermatophytosis which is going to be increased we'll all be you know in fact happy to treat because this is one infection which is a very easily uh, diagnosable infection and all it takes is just you look at it you know it's tinea corporis and you like to you write the prescription patient gets all right and the patient is happy too but the present scenario is entirely different infections are not that easily treated because you know there is a difference in the strain i will talk about it with you later so the infections have become widespread and the patients have started getting chronic infection chronic infection means which can be more than 6 months over a period of 6 months either there can be a continuous infection or you could have infections that come and go infections that come after within 4 weeks after treatment or within 6 weeks after treatment and uh, infection of the face the tinea facia is becoming very common and uh, most importantly the steroid modified tinea abuse of topical corticosteroids results in steroid modified tinea is the years when you commonly talk about the predisposing factor for dermatophytosis they say overcrowding low socio economic status and poor hygiene and these were the reasons well known for predisposing to dermatophytosis but the present scenario you have additionally other factors also as i told you earlier years if it was dermatophytosis it would be only present by annual it would be may june july again probably pre monsoon it can be in october november but then now you have dermatophytosis cases throughout the year you all must have been experiencing it also be it not only in tamil nadu it is across the country be from you know kashmir to kanyakumari and this side from the east to west from gujarat to assam this is the same story dermatophytosis is seen across india throughout the year and apart from global warming what other factors could be related to probably that there is a change definitely in our lifestyle also uh, genes have become almost like the national costumes so starting from your metro worker to the ceos and it firms everyone you know wears jeans and the leggings again which is not definitely the dress for our hot and humid weather that is prevalent in our part of the country or even elsewhere and uh, most importantly what we have to note is i would like to bring your attention to this point of the rampant abuse of the irrational combinations of topical corticosteroid anti fungal anti bacterial creams that is available in our country you have the triple combinations the quadruple combinations and even five in it you know there's a famous brand dash five which is being used it is available over the counter and all that this needed is a patient walks up to the pharmacist and you know he asks for a cream for the fungal infection and the pharmacist happily hands over to this hands over this cream and this when it is applied the anti inflammatory property of topical corticosteroid gives an instant relief patient applies it for 4 to 5 days and with a relief stops applying by the time there is enough local immunosuppression the dermatophytes multiply all the more and there is a flare of the lesion so this cycle vicious cycle goes on and on and on and uh, parents uh, unknowingly i mean 
uh, it is ignorance is bliss for them. So they apply these topical corticosteroid fungal free, antifungal combination creams on their children as well. So it is the family members. So when you see a child with dermatophytosis, especially an infant or neonate and toddler, you have to ask for an index case as we do for those children with leprosy. We always have to spot the index case because there is someone else who's always giving this infection to the child. So it is important that we treat the index case as well. And of course, immunosuppressive states increase in dermatophytosis is something really well understandable. And the other point which I would like to tell you all is that throughout the Easter years, it was like the common, most common organism causing dermatophytosis was trichoidon rubra. But then there has been a shift in the etiological agent. And now what is more prevalent is trichoidon mentographite species complex. This is supposed to be very virulent. So that is one of the reasons why we are finding it difficult to treat the infection and not in a Antifungal resistance for fluconazole has been known, well known, and occasionally to griseofilvin also. But terbenafin, which is a fungicidal drug, now there has been an increase in the incidence of antifungal resistance to terbenafin, a fungicidal drug. So terbenafin does not work well for a nave, I mean for steroid modified tenia, for a chronic tenia. Probably for a nave tenia, when you have nothing applied, it works. There is not much of literature available for dermatophytosis in children. Now, these few papers, if you have a look at it, you're able to see that history of family contact or close contact members having dermatophytosis is really high. It's 91.9 percentage in this study. And similarly, if you see the topical corticosteroid abuse, it is again in the high 94 and 85 percentage. And what was the corticosteroid that way they were using? Clobidazole propionate. Now, clobidazole propionate is a superpotent corticosteroid which has no way to be used in children. We say only in children beyond 12 years we use clobidazole, or if your child has probably a palmar plantar psoriasis from 8 years, 10 years, we would tend to use clobidazole. Otherwise, this particular molecule is not to be used in children. But then, unfortunately, all these combination creams contain either clobidazole or the other potent corticosteroid called mumidazone, which is again used in children only beyond 2 years. So you can we easily see that 86% had applied clobidazole propionate in this paper and they had extensive disease as well. Just to show you a couple of cases, again, steroid modified tenia, eczematous tenia corporis. This child again had chronic dermatophytosis more than one year duration when all the family members were affected with dermatophytosis. This is steroid modified tenia. If you have residents, now steroid modified tenia, when you say this term will, uh, refers to lesions, which is still recognizable as dermatophytosis in spite of topical corticosteroid use. Whereas when I say tenia incognito, if there'll be only papules, there won't be any border. Normally we know that dermatophytosis has a clear cut border, papules in the periphery, active periphery and central clearing. But when you say tenia incognito, there could be papules, like there'll not be any scales. And so you need to have a high degree of suspicion and probably we have to go for a potassium hydroxide mark. Now this is the steroid modified tenia. Again, in steroid modified tenia, we say this tenia pseudo imbricata. You would have come across this term quite often. Tenia pseudo imbricata is double wave. You have ring within ring appearance, actually. That is because of the intermittent use of tropical corticosteroids. Here we see a tenia manuum, again, a good border scene. So, here again, this is a border scene, tenia manuum. And uh, this is tenia pedis, this is a small blister scene. This is a vesicular bullous type of tenia pedis, and this is a macassins type of tenia pedis. So this child had, is a post -renal, I mean, renal transplant recipient, you're able to make out the atypical manifestation of dermatophytosis. You're not able to see the central clearing that much. It is only a diffuse scaly pattern or psoriasiform pattern. Another child with hyper IG syndrome having tenia corporis. This child, I just uh, seen him recently, some two months ago, I think. He was such a leukemia, an ALL case, and he was on treatment. And you can see the psoriasiform tenia corporis. And not enough, he had tenia fasciae. We're able to make out the border here. And apart from tenia facia, he had tenia capitis as well, actually. So multiple sites being affected. So normally, what should be the differential diagnosis that we consider for tenia corporis? Now, that depends upon the presentation. If you're just seeing a single lesion or lesions like this, heral part of pitreas and dosi is one differential diagnosis. Granuloma annulae, which is very common in children, is also a differential diagnosis. But here you will see that there'll be erythematous papules in the periphery. But we do not see any scales. It's a non-itchy condition. And you will have a central clearing. It is an annular lesion, no doubt. But then there is no central clearing and absolutely no itching and patient is asymptomatic. And uh, that is how it is actually. And these do not progress further. And this is a namular eczema or a discoid eczema or a coin-shaped eczema. We are able to make out the papules and vesicles actually. 
so much of thrusting and intense itching. So that is again a closed differential diagnosis for dermatophytosis. So when we are in doubt, this is a simple, very simple test. We just have to take the scale from the patient and then you know add 20% potassium hydroxide. You'll be seeing the characteristic dermatophytes which look like this: hyaline log, branching septate, hyphae. And academic interest, we see the culture. So that is rubrum and this is trichophyton mentographites. So having seen the larger type of tenia uh, dermatophytosis, this is tenia capitis. In tenia capitis, the most important history that we would ask for is, is any history of tonsure or hair cut three weeks prior to the onset of the lesions. That is the incubation period for dermatophytes. Invariably, they'd say they would have had a, a tonsure in a religious place and uh, that's how the infection starts because of transmission through the barber's instruments. And sometimes it can be from playmates also. So we have to ask for similar history in this playmates or siblings, issue of sharing of toys, issue of playing with pet animals like cats. That is also an important uh, history for the tenia capitis actually. So here we see the gray patch is the most common type. Here again in tenia capitis, you have non-inflammatory inflammatory. This is a non-inflammatory type. You're able to make out the hair which is lustreless and brittle and scales, patchy loss of hair. And uh, this is black dot type of tenia capitis actually. And this is an yet another type. You are able to see some patchy hair loss with not obvious scales, but if you scratch, you might be able to make out discernible scales. This is one of the most uh, important differential diagnosis for alopecia areata. And this type is very common in adolescence. So whenever you see a child with tenia capitis, please look at whether you know there is an extension from the neck to the scalp because that is the glabrous type of tenia capitis. From the face again, you have to see there is an extension into the hairy area, and that is called as the glabrous type of tenia capitis. And uh, this is the inflammatory type of tenia capitis, which is called as a kirion. Normally, we see a swelling, which will be boggy to touch, and you will be seeing pustules sudded on the surface. And these broken bits of hair will be removable like a pin on a cushion. So, because we need to differentiate it from bacterial abscess. In bacterial abscess, obviously, there's not going to be any patchy loss of hair. And uh, if you try to pull the hair from that area, it's definitely going to be painful, and the child will be screaming. But here, you know, you can just gently remove the hair and the uh, child is quiet and that is one of those very easy signs to differentiate a fungal abscess from a bacterial abscess. So this is a kerion. Normally we say children with long hair, girls with long hair do not get tenia capitis because you know the males are more prone to developing tenia capitis but these days, I mean this child again I think recently two or three months back, siblings who had uh, tenia capitis, you're able to see the abscess type of tenia capitis here. Pustules. Pustules is again one other inflammatory type and sometimes you can have mixed patch also. This child mixed type, he has grey patch, pustules and patchy loss of hair actually. So differential diagnosis for tenia capitis, I already mentioned about alopecia areata which is an autoimmune condition. So differentiating between alopecia areata and the smooth patch calvinous type of tenia capitis, we have to do a potassium hydroxide examination or a dermoscopy. So dermoscopy is again a tool which is available these days which can easily help us to differentiate between these two conditions. And patchy loss of hair, again, another differential diagnosis is trichotillomania. These children can have other anxiety behaviors also. Could be bedwetting or thumb sucking, uh, nail biting and things like that. And uh, trichotillomania will be in the most accessible site. And the hair will be of varying lengths. That is some one important point. It will be in the accessible site, actually. And sometimes, of course, the braiding style, the traction alopecia also can be considered as a differential diagnosis. Whereas in psoriasis and seborrheic dermatitis, we do not talk about any loss of hair. And this is how we confirm the etiology of tenia capitis. So this is potassium hydroxide wet mount. And this is a dermoscopic feature of tenia capitis. We see comma hairs and foil hairs and zigzag hairs. And uh, in the Western uh, countries, wood slamp is used as a screening tool for tenia capitis because the most common organisms like microsporum canis and odoni and all, they fluoresce under the wood slam, but here the most common causative organisms are trichoderma violaceum and tonsurans, which do not fluoresce. Coming to the nail infection in children, this is very uncommon actually, because why is it less common in children unless until you have a child who's been playing in water for a long time or who has hyperhidrosis or if there is some other uh, immunosuppressive conditions like uh, chronic candidiasis, chronic mucoglutinous candidiasis, that is the time we talk about onychomycosis in children. But otherwise, normally it is less common in children because the surface area is small. Another thing is they're not that prone to trauma. And more than that is the rate of growth of the nail. It's a faster growth of nail compared to the adults actually. So the dermatophytes does not really get time to settle down there actually. So having seen the three types of the skin, hair and nail 
dermatophytosis, let us see how do we treat them. The present scenario, what is most important is to give counseling to the patients regarding the general measures. In case of young children, of course, to the parents and the adolescents to make the patient understand that the adherence to general measures is very, very important. You can always ask for a review at the end of second week or third week. And here, the treatment regimens that have been mentioned in our standard textbooks of two weeks for terbinafin or one week for etroconazole does not hold good anymore. You might have to continue the treatment until the child becomes all right. So the duration is going to be much longer and it has to be individualized according to the clinical response. So, and uh, only topical antifungal can be used in localized infection or when the child has hepatic failure or in very young infants. But if it's going to be steroid modified dermatophytosis or chronic infection, we definitely have to go for a systemic and topical antifungal combination and uh, it has to be continued for a longer time. And what are the general measures that we have to advise the patients? Patients, we have to importantly tell them that the child has to take bath twice daily in cold water, wipe dry immediately after taking bath, and emollient application is very important because per se, dermatophytosis and steroid modified tenia, there is dry barrier dysfunction. There's a dry skin. So you need an emollient to make this skin smooth and uh, it will definitely give a good symptom relief to the patients. So application of thin layer of coconut oil is very good immediately after drying the skin that can be applied and the next antifungal cream can be applied at least 20 minutes to 30 minutes after application of the coconut oil. And the clothes have to be washed in hot water and dried in good sunlight inside out and the infected clothes have to be washed separately and dried separately. And definitely a big no to all these leggings. We always have to encourage them to wear loose cotton clothing. And those of them who do not have access to sunlight, probably we could ask them to iron their clothes. And in the case of rainy season, the clothes could be probably put over the boiling water vessel or lid. And then, you know, it can be dried also. And these hostel students, they have a peculiar problem because they are not allowed to dry their inner garments outside the room. They have to dry it only inside the room. Then you can imagine if it's going to be hot and humid weather, children most often tend to wear the damp garments. So we have to tell them that, you know, those that get washed on Monday can be worn on Thursday or Friday, fully, making fully well sure that the children wear only dry garments. And another problem is the sports, the daily wear that people use, most of the times these students use is the sports gear. And that is going to be synthetic. So we have to advise them to use only cotton clothing. And that is very, very important. And again, after their gym or sports, whatever activities they participate, they have to take bath immediately after sweating. So they, if they're very tired, they tend to you know sleep or just take rest for one or two hours and only later they go and take bath. And that duration of one or two hours is good enough for the dermatophytes to multiply in the fertile milieu, that is the sweat. And obese children, again, obesity is a very common problem that we face today. So obese children should not wear these shaped inner garments. They should be asked to wear the boxer type of inner garments, very important. And if it is there is senior fetus, again, open footwear and cotton socks only should be encouraged. Most important, sharing of fomites among the family members, be it towels, soaps, or among the students, or the, I mean, hostel students, they could always share it with their friends. So it's very important that we ask them not to share the personal belongings. And this habit of wearing the waistband or a wristband, again, this should be removed because now these organisms, both trichovidone rubrum or metagraphites, they stay in the environment. Uh, rubrum stays for at least three months and metagraphite stays for at least 20 weeks, five months. So we have to make sure that it will be there in the fomites and it can again come back to the individual. So that is why it is important that we keep the beddings and the other uh, belongings also clean. Very important. And the most important is these, um, the parents might get addicted to the potential of the anti-inflammatory property of the corticosteroids. So they might continue to use the topical corticosteroid antifungal combination creams even with our prescription of our systemic antifungal. So we have to make sure that that is not being done and they should be always stopped abruptly. There's no question of you know, stopping it gradually. So corticosteroid combination creams do not have any role to play in the management of dermatophytosis, even if it is for one day. So as I already told you, environment cleaning is also very important. So vacuum cleaning or washing with detergent should be done. And uh, if, apart from that, if we have a polyclinic setup or it's always night in the clinic setup to, to put up some posters also for these fungal infections because in WHO study, they say that 50% of the patients, they walk out of the physician's chamber without understanding what is being told to them. So it is worthwhile to have some sort of an, uh, pamphlets or something to 
re re reinstate whatever we've been told to them actually so some whatsapp flyers can also be shared so that will help you because all these will definitely contribute to the success of the therapeutic outcome in the patients I already mentioned about when we use only topical antifungal so when it is a naive tenia without any application or a localized tenia which is going to be only 2 to 5 cm when you have an infant or hepatic failure only topical antifungal should do taking care of the general measures and now what are the topical antifungals that are available we have all these azoles are well known to all of you these are the newer azoles ceraconazole ebirconazole and lindiconazole but if you really have to go by the fda approval ceraconazole and uh, Amarolfin, they get you know they recognize I mean approved for use beyond twelve years. In the case of luliconazole, if the child has tenia corporis, it can be approved two years and older. Children can be used. And in the case of uh, tenia pedis and tenia cruris, it is approved for children aged twelve years and above. And uh, cycloperoxolimin is approved for children aged ten years and above. Now it does not mean now these I mean these azoles are not being used in younger children. Just that we do not have any studies for it actually. And tamoxifen cream, of course, is used in children beyond two years of age. So any of these azoles or cycloperoxolimin tamoxifen cream can be used accordingly. But what is most important is when you choose a topical antifungal here, the cost-effective option is very important because if the child is going to have thirty percent, forty percent body surface area, so we have to prescribe something which is going to be affordable for the patient and where there will be compliance and they have to continue for a longer time. And if we see the individual property, if there is a steroid abuse, probably you could use one of these azoles because these azoles they also have an anti-inflammatory property. So though anti-inflammatory property of corticosteroids and this may not match, but when we want to stop the corticosteroids and then apply some azole antifungus, it would be worthwhile to use ketoconazole, ebuconazole, or cetaconazole. And luliconazole is the one which has the minimum, I mean the lowest. Minimum inhibitory concentration again very effective drug, but of course little costly has a reservoir effect also. And we would not want to use amphotericin B definitely not. And these are antifungals which have sporocytal action. And the ester years we were using Whitfield ointment. Whitfield ointment has an additional point of keratolytic action because of the salicylic acid, but it should never be used in the flexures or in the case of young children or face because it can have an irritant potential actually. Emollients are already mentioned. It can be the coconut oil or sometimes the moisturizers if the child does not want to apply coconut oil in the morning. But of course, in the night or in the evenings when I come back, I always tell them, you know, you have to use a coconut oil because that has a good relief. Coconut oil contains a, a lauric acid and capric acid, which is supposed to have antifungal property also. The next question of do we use antifungal soaps, antifungal powders? Can we use? That is very important to address this issue because. We do not have to spend money on these antifungal soaps and powders because this problem of antifungal resistance is promoted because of this. Because these contain very low concentration of the antifungal, and any low concentration of antifungal can always breed antifungal resistance. So it is better not to spend money on antifungal soaps and antifungal powders. Instead, if there is a child who is obese who would want to use some antifungal uh, powders, I mean, who want to use some powders in the area of friction, the intertrigo, the groin, or the intermammary area, probably we can only ask them to use a non-medicated powder, which is much better actually. And uh, I already mentioned about this, how you know steroids will cause a barrier dysfunction because it is increasing the transectomal water loss, making the skin dry. Again, it reduces the ceramides, again, making decreasing the fat content of the skin also. And uh, how should the topical antifungal be applied? It should be applied two centimeters beyond. From the normal skin, it should be started applying towards the area. And it should be applied twice daily. Most of them are twice daily, except uh, luliconazole and oxyconazole, bifenazole. And it should be applied for two weeks beyond clinical resolution because we know that the fungi is staying there. Probably we do not want any residual fungi there in the border. So at least for two weeks beyond clinical resolution, we definitely have to apply topical corticosteroids. And this has been agreed by all the guidelines also. We have been having recent guideline recommendations for the management of dermatophytosis. And these are the indications for systemic therapy. Anything, I mean, apart from whatever I mentioned, the uh, localized uh, therapy for, I mean, in, indication for uh, topical therapy, all these are indications for systemic therapy. Whenever we have hair infection, nail infection, extensive infection, and immunosuppressive stage, yes, systemic therapy has to be given. And uh, dose, the uh, most important thing is fluconazole is a very safe option uh, which can be given in children. There are two dosage options. Either it is given twice weekly or thrice weekly. And the other option is given daily dosage. So daily dosage we give for four weeks and twice weekly we give it for eight weeks. 
and uh, terbinafrin this it goes according to the weight of the child between 10 to 20 we give 62.5 mg 20 to 40 it is 125 but terbinafrin these days is most often kept only for children with tinea capitis actually griseofilvin again for tinea capitis and or for chronic dermatophytosis also there are some people who do give griseofilvin itraconazole is one option again uh, capsule 5 mg per kilogram per uh, day is again given three weeks should be this is the minimum duration in fact i already mentioned how the individualization is very important for the duration of therapy depending on the clinical response. And in tinea capitis, terbinafrin is definitely the drug of choice. The disadvantage with griseofilin is it is definitely effective in tinea capitis, but the problem is you have to give it for a much longer duration, at least 8 to 12 weeks. Here, probably we could go for 4 to 6 weeks. So it's very economical also. One tablet bought and you can use it for 4 days. So it is something which is economical and cost effective also. Onychomycosis is very, uh, it's less common in children. So we do use the dosage, ther pulse therapy is given actually. So pulse therapy, we give two pulses for fingernails and three pulses for toenails. And you give it in a dosage of three to seven milligram per kilogram per day. So if the child, this is, you know, this is a very uh, uncommon situation, I suppose. I just wanted to bring your attention to it that, you know, yes, we do get onychomycosis in children, but not regularly. And there are people who give continuous therapy also with terbinafrin for two to three months. And uh, normally, therapy, systemic therapy of uh, antifungals is going to be supplemented by when you use a nail lacquer. Nail lacquers, we have topical cycloperoxolamine, amarolfin. Amarolfin gets used weekly twice and cycloperoxolamine nail lacquer gets used every day and this is for 12 years and above. And uh, if anybody is interested in the novel ones, something new options to look for, epineconazole and overall, of course, they are available in the United States of America and approved for six years in our but not as yet in India. So if we see the safety profile, fluconazole is one drug which we can start using from neonate onwards actually. And uh, Grisio, Terbinafrin, Itraconazole is beyond two years. Of course, we do have studies for beyond six months in the case of Itraconazole and Griseofilvin. The oral granules of Terbinafrin is only beyond four years of age actually. So having seen dermatophytosis, we move on to the less common the next common infection, the pityriasis versicolor. Here we see hypopigmented, well-defined hypopigmented patches, macules and patches with fine brand-like scales. You can see in the paranasal area and young infants, sometimes we do see these well-defined hypopigmented lesions. And it's always important that you stretch the skin and see whether the borders are well-defined and you can just scratch and see if there are brand-like scales because pityriasis means brand-like, versicolor means you can have chromic or achromic. So that fine brand-like scales and well-defined lesions will help us to differentiate it from pityriasis alba. So here again, we see the chromic pityriasis versicolor actually. So this is a very close differential diagnosis, but you see that the lesion is totally ill-defined. An ill-defined hypopigmented patch is going to be pityriasis alba. If it's going to be polymorphic light adaption, the child will complain of itching after exposure to sunlight actually. In the case of early vitiligo, there is no scaling. So these three conditions, Pityriasis versicolor, pityriasis alba, and polymorphic light adaption, seborrheic dermatitis are scaly hypopigmented patches, whereas indeterminate Hansen and early vitiligo are non-scaly hypopigmented patches, actually. So when we are in doubt, we do a potassium hydroxide mouth, and this is the famous spaghetti meatball or banana grapes appearance. And uh, treatment, again, general measures here, again, importance of avoidance of sweating is not possible, means they have to take bath twice daily and use only cotton clothing. If there are only localized lesions, this topical antifungal should do. But when we have extensive lesions, recurrent lesions, or pre-op, that is the time when we opt for both topical and systemic antifungals together, actually. So all these assholes are very effective in the treatment of malassezia infection. This is the pityriasis versicolor. And uh, duration here, it is not as uh, like as we see in dermatophytosis. Even just two to four weeks of treatment should be uh, good enough, actually. But the problem is with achromic pityriasis versicolor, the, the hypopigmentation takes a little longer to disappear. So that is one cause of concern. And again, the recurrence is a main problem. If it, Most of the times, pityriasis versicolor is uh, extensive in adolescence because we know it, it is present, especially in the seboric areas, the chest, the trunk, the back. So, and the adolescents are pretty worried about this particular infection. So whenever we see an infection which is extensive, we ask for short contact topical antifungal therapy. So either a ketoconazole lotion or a selenium sulfide or zinc pyrithion can be applied. We have to ask the child to apply it from the behind the ears, retroauricular area down to the trunk, over the arms, 
and uh, just 15 minutes before bath, 10 to 15 minutes before bath, and then after bath, child can apply one of the topical antifungals as we saw as old or cycloperoxolamin. This can go on for a period of two to two weeks actually. And systemic we give fluconazole, it's a single dose, of, uh, which is you know eight milligram per kilogram per dose stat. So in young adolescent, probably you can almost anything who, who's going to be more than 50 kg can receive at least 400 milligrams, a single dose. And sometimes people do repeat it after one week. That is the pulse therapy of fluconazole for extensive pediatric versicolor. Itraconazole 600 milligram single dose is also one of those therapeutic options for extensive pediatric versicolor. In the case of recurrence, this is again a problem in those individuals who have hyperhidrosis. So recurrence, we always advise them to use uh, fluconazole once a month. 400 milligrams once a month, and this can go on for four to five months, or itraconazole 400 milligrams, 200 milligrams twice daily, once a month for six months. And there are even options for using ketoconazole shampoo for only three days a month, or one day a month for continuously six months. So these are options for extensive and recurrent pityriasis versicolor. Canidiasis, of course, this is very well known to all of you in this, you know, I mean, in, you know, in young infants, of course, we can see this neonates and infants, we can see oral thrush. So we have to look at the other options and uh, just a clotomazole mouth pain should be good enough. And uh, in the intertigenous areas like neck and groin, clotomazole cream should be good. Again, the intertrigo groin and intertrigo submammary, intermammary area is one of those common problems these days in obese children. So we have to ask them to keep the area dry, use cotton clothing, and use one of these topical azoles for a period of two to three weeks. So having seen the superficial fungal infections, I thought I would take you through the uh, subcutaneous fungal infection. This is supposed to be a little rare, but you do see this once in a while in your clinical practice. There will be a child who has an asymptomatic swelling, which is going to be present over the law end. And this is a typical finding. You will have a swelling which is firm in consistency and we will be able to easily lift the swelling. You will be able to insinuate your fingers beneath the swelling. Most often it gets uh, identified as an abscess and you will have multiple INDs done. And uh, sometimes when they do a histopathology, they might say this is going to be a foreign body granuloma. But then this is a subcutaneous fungal infection called as desideobolomycosis. And this is something which we can see in children, especially in the groin, on the loin, and in the limbs, actually. So this is the fungus which is seen. So you have to mention, whenever you have an asymptomatic swelling, which can be easily uh, lifted and where we can insulate our fingers with an Indian rubber consistency, we call the firm consistency. Please, you, when you ask for a biopsy, you'll have to mention whether it could be mycosis, then the pathologist will be able to see these fungal hyphae. Otherwise, it gets in, just reported as a foreign body granuloma. And potassium iodide is the gold standard for this particular infection. Again, cotrimoxol is also one of those good options apart from mitraconazole. And we continued for at least three months after complete resolution. And this potassium iodide, we administer 40 to 60 milligrams per kilogram body weight. We take it as 2 grams in 100 ml. And according to the dosage, we calculate and then give it to the child in empty stomach along with to juice or milk or cold water. So to conclude, fungal infections in children, superficial fungal infections are more common. And these days, it is every other day, we've been seeing loads and loads of children with dermatophytosis, wherein the counseling is most important. We have to tell them that the adherence to general measures is very, very important. And in the case of neonates, infants, and young children, yes, we have to spot the index case. And the duration has to be individualized according to the clinical response. And topical therapy, we have to follow the rule of two. And definitely there's no role for corticosteroid combination creams in the case of dermatophytosis. And uh, in the case of superficial and subcutaneous and opportunistic mycosis, of course, we need to have a high degree of clinical suspicion. And potassium hydroxide mount itself is a good, very simple and easy tool to easily identify the fungus at an early stage itself. So thank you all for your patient listening. Thank you. Wonderful presentation, madam. That's up to you. <laughs> it was very practical and very useful. Thank you. Thank you for your visit. Thank you, sir. Madam. Thank you. Uh, so sir, I think there's a question, sir. Arlalan, sir, has uh, asked about the posters. I can always share it, sir. Uh, Arlalan, sir, can share the number with Dr. Dakshayani, and I will definitely uh, share the posters with you all. You can always put it up in the posters. Put it up in your clinic. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And uh, there's also in between, you can uh, put your questions in the chat box so that subsequent uh, discussion later on also it can be. 
taken. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Dashaini. Yeah, madam. Hello. I think we can move. Uh, we can move on to that next speaker. Uh, sir, excuse me, sir. So, because I have another meeting to attend, shall I take leave? If there are any questions, thank, I... thank you. Oh, oh, okay, ma'am. Can mail it to ah, me. Yes, you are audible, ma'am. Ah, yes, Dashaini, yes, proceed. Ah. Madam is going for a meeting. So, that yes, any other thank questions? You. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, so, I think there are no questions in the chat box oh, or the question yes. answer box. Okay, okay. So, it's a very, very practical and useful. Yes, so that, sir. More than no the treatment per ah, se, yeah. the yeah. Yeah. Uh, advice yes. that we should be giving the patients, the counseling is all what yes. that matters in dermatological practice. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. So, we now have the next speaker. Uh, Dr. S. Murugu Sundaram, uh, founder and medical director of Chennai Skin Foundation and Yesuday and Research uh, Institute. Uh, he is the founder secretary of the Hair Research Society of India and uh, a fellow of the American Academy of Dermatology, member of the International Society of Dermatology. And he's been the reviewer, reviewer for uh, various international and national journals in dermatology. Uh, he's a member of the IADVL Academic Council and he's got more than 250 national and international publications to his credits, uh, author textbook and atlas of trichology and his uh, area of interest uh, include uh, pediatric dermatology and trichology. Um, uh, so he's been awarded the best doctor award by the Tamil Nadu Dr. MGR Medical University in the year 2012. And uh, he's invented novel accessories like fixer, accelerator, and the list is endless. So um, I would now uh, like to invite our next speaker, Dr. S. Murugu Sundaram, for his talk on hair problems in children. Over to you, sir. Welcome, sir. Welcome, Murugu Sundaram, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is my screen visible, sir? Yes, sir. sir. Yes, sir. Visible, sir. You are very well audible. Yes, sir. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sridevi and Dr. Dakshani and all the esteemed members of the AAP for giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity uh, to speak in front of this August gathering. Uh, I was asked to talk on hair problems in children. Hair disorders in pediatric age group are predominantly congenital, immunological, and nutritional, and due to infections and infestations compared to hair disorders in the adolescent and adult populations, which are predominantly andro and genetic, androgen and genetic. But it's also important to note that the fact that androgenetic alopecia is also becoming increasingly common in the pediatric age group, most probably due to the genetic, hormonal and lifestyle influences. And why pediatric trichology and whom are the uh, um, patients affected? Uh, mainly the atopic children, obese children, uh, children born out of consanguineous parentage, malnourished children, children with endocrine disorders, children with genetic syndromes, and children especially who are under stress. So I, d I uh, developed a simple working classification which was published in the Indian Journal of Pediatric Dermatology 2010 because there is no uh, proper classification of uh, um, hair disorders in children available so far. So the hair, um, hair disorders can be classified as developmental alopecias. Uh, alopecias are hair loss due to infections and infestations, autoimmune alopecias, psychogenic alopecias, malnutritional alopecias, miscellaneous alopecias, and pigmentary disorders, and pediatric hypertrichosis or hirsutism. <clears throat> in the developmental alopecia, we have um, various categories like no hair, in alopecia congenita and atrichia with papular lesions, which is a very close differential diagnosis for alopecia totalis and alopecia universalis. Sparse hair, where you get in hypotrichosis simplex, hereditary hypotrichosis, and ectodermal dysplasias. Abnormal hair, as in monolithic, spilatotate, trichonexis, nodosa, trichonexis invaginata, woolly hair, loose antigen syndrome, patchy hair loss, uh, as uh, in. Um, Congenitally in aplasia cutis, occipital alopecia of the newborn, uh, various nevi and triangular alopecias, and colored hair in oleosis, Wardenburg syndrome, and many other syndromes, 
and infections and infest infestations. So we had a very uh, elaborative and uh, extensive uh, uh, informative talk by Dr. Madhu about this uh, trichomycosis. And uh, we have uh, seborrheic dermatitis and pleiadra. Autoimmune alopecia is the most common autoimmune alopecia in children is alopecia areata, which is the second most common cause of alopecia in children. And alopecia associated with other autoimmune disorders, especially SLE, is also quite common in children. Psychogenic alopecia is like trichotillomania, trichotiromania, and trichotemnomania, and trichotil, which we all uh, will see uh, in detail in a uh, little later. And the malnutrition alopecia, we have this telogen effluvium, tricolored hair, diffuse hair loss, making pattern hair loss. These are all due to the nutritional deficiencies. And the miscellaneous alopecias like hair cast, traction alopecias, acquired partial curly hair, androgenetic alopecia in children, which is becoming very common. And uh, pigmentary disorders as in genetic hypomelanosis, where, where the, com the hair is completely white, it is diffuse whitening. And uh, you, can have, you can also have circumscribed coliosis, a tuft of whitened uh, hair or the gray hair. And uh, premature canitis, which is not white hair, but it is gray hair lightened hair or the gray hair. Um, it could be either canitis symptomativa due to acute fever or Graves' disease, which is uh, due to rapid, uh, which causes rapid graying. And uh, pernicious anemia, malnutrition and malignancy, which causes gradual graying. It's called canitis subita, which is uh, overnight graying, uh, which is acute diffuse alopecia data after uh, severe emotional stress. You have um, uh, overnight grain because the alopecia rita does not affect the gray hairs, it affects only the pigmented hairs. So the, it appears that the gray hairs. And pediatric hypertension. So this is alopecia congenita, which is also called atrichia congenita. It's an autosomal dominant. Oh, no, 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 no. There are only Lanugo hairs present. Uh, there are associated uh, rare. Uh, associations are only present because it is not usually associated with any other congenital anomaly. It is usually an isolated anomaly. Um, atrichia with papular lesions is very common in patients from Iran, Pakistan. It is uh, mistaken for alopecia areata and alopecia totalis. Uh, the uh, child starts losing hair after six months. There are also, along with the patchy hair loss, there are papular lesions in the elbows, knees, and cheeks. But these are very rare. And we found a lot of this hypotrichosis simplex. This is called congenital hypotrichosis simplex, which is very common in the South Indian population, South Indian children. And we also found the gene for this, this map to the uh, P2, P2RY5 gene uh, mutations, and also the lipase H gene. And we also, uh, along with a, um, with a group from Germany, we uh, Publish this, and we see a lot of this congenital hypotrichosis, which is also treatable. I will show you some slides how this is easily treatable. This is a case of uh, congenital hypotrichosis, uh, which runs in the family. It is autosomal recessive, so only one is affected. Woolly hair is also similar to congenital hypotrichosis. You may have woolly hair nevus sometimes. Without any nevus, you may have woolly hair. Um, woolly hair sometimes may also occur. Uh, prior to androgenetic alopecia. You would have seen some children telling that the hair has become uh, wavy and curly uh, suddenly because it could be an uh, uh, early stage of androgenetic alopecia. But that is different from this congenital woolly hair. You see the woolly hair and um, this is very commonly associated with hypotrichosis. Ectodermal dysplasia, you would have seen in many cases of ectodermal dysplasia with the dental anomalies and the, uh, the uh, saddle nose and uh, the features are very clear. You have this monolithrix with a trichoscope. Trichoscope is uh, the, uh, the common dermoscope can be used as a trichoscope, which is the magic wand of the Harry Potter, H-E-I-R-Y, Harry Potter. And you can see many hair shaft defects with the trichoscope. So you can easily diagnose many hair shaft defects with the trichoscope. This is the beaded hair of monolithrix. This is trichorexis nodosa, hair breaks at the site of the node, and trichorexis invaginata, as if two hairs are um, attached to each other at the broken end, trichorexis invaginata. And pilate torte, these are all congenital hair disorders where you have this twisted hairs. We uh, presented a few. Uh, a series of cases of this uh, uh, spangled hair. 
it looks like this child has done some straightening of hair, but it is not straightened hair, it is a conjunctular disorder with the atopic uh, uh, diathesis. Most of the atopic children may have this, and this is a condition called pile annulate, where you see this alternating light and dark bands with spangled appearance of the hair. And you see the ash shaft defects of the trichoscope itself, and we also do the polarized light microscopy where you see these alternating light and dark bands, which confirm this pile annulate. This is a normal hair, which is a very unique feature of this uh, South Indian uh, hair for women, uh, this kind of bushy hair. We have seen many patients from Kerala, Kanyakumari, and uh, Nagarkoli, uh, this kind of bushy hair. This is, uh, sometimes these uh, hairs may have an ash shaft defect called pile triangulate canaliculate. But this is normal and this, uh, we have many uh, patients commonly uh, walking in with this kind of thing. Then the occipital alopecia of the newborn, which is a, a patchy alopecia due to the asynchrony of the, um, the vellus hair uh, falling and then the terminal hair growing. So it is uh, when the, uh, after the first year of tonsuring, when the synchrony is complete, when, the, when all the hairs are terminal, then it uh, disappears on its own. Because the, the, all the hairs are vellus and uh, telogen, when they put the child on the floor, uh, it uh, easily rubs and then because the friction, the hair is easily removed. This is the occipital alopecia or the patchy alopecia of the newborn. And usually no, no treatment is required and uh, the hair regrows by itself. And this is congenital triangular alopecia or also called broad nevus. The congenital, it is called temporal triangular alopecia. Usually the triangles appear on the temporal area. The uh, triangles can appear in all the areas, sometimes in verse, uh, vertex and also in the occipital area. This is a congenital temporal triangular alopecia. It is very important to identify this uh, type of hair loss because it is not like alopecia areata. You, don't, uh, uh, you can't regrow hair with any sort of treatment. There is no need to apply a steroid, no need to use an intralation steroid uh, because the hair will never grow. It's a congenital hair loss. And uh, it will appear only when, when, the, when the child uh, becomes older and uh, it uh, develops an androgenetic alopecia. Only then you will see the patch. So it is, uh, they only need a reassurance for this. And as uh, Dr. Madhu explained, uh, we have a lot of uh, infections and infestations, uh, of which the most common is the uh, dermatophytosis or the trichomycosis. Of the trichomycosis, we have tinea capitis, then the Saccharid dermatitis and Piedra. Of the tinea capitis, you have various uh, uh, types of tinea capitis like Kirion. We have uh, uh, the Kirion itself, you have abscess type, pustular type, Favus type, you have gray patch, you have black dot, and uh, you have very uh, varied uh, morphological presentations of uh, tinea capitis. Very common after this uh, tonsuring in uh, uh, pilgrimage centers because of the contaminated blades and barber's knives and fomites like towels, combs and headdress, and uh, sometimes the barber's hands also. And it is very common in children. And uh, even now it is still common in, very, uh, in uh, many parts of India. And you have seborrheic dermatitis, and sometimes you have A like uh, trichomycosis, and uh, the most common agents are trichobiton violation and trichobiton tonsurance. It is named tonsurance because it follows uh, tonsuring and uh, microsporum in Western countries, and uh, trichobiton violation is also very common in India. This is a kirion. You see the boggy swelling, exuding pus. The hair can be easily removed, like as if you are removing a pin from a cushion. Most of these kirions are uh, mistaken for an abscess and they do IND and it becomes ends up in a scarring alopecia. So it's very important to identify this kirion and treat with an antifungal, which very uh, quickly responds to treatment. And you can save the hair and you can also prevent the scarring alopecia. This is a gray patch. You can see the dermatophytosis of the skin also. This is a glabrous type of uh, uh, tinea corporis. This is the black dot tinea capitis. This is the seborrheic dermatitis. You can see the borders and you can see the patches. Normally when the, the hair is not removed, uh, it is very difficult to identify the seborrheic dermatitis, but with the dermoscope or the trichoscope, you can easily see the scales and you can easily differentiate the seborrheic dermatitis from psoriasis because the scales from seborrheic dermatitis are oily and they are very uh, 
PC, um, whereas in psoriasis, they are very dry and uh, they are uh, powdery. This is a bacterial infection of the scalp, folliculitis decalvans, and which leads to scarring alopecia. So this also can be easily treated, but is identified properly. You can see already the scar setting in on the scalp. This is also sometimes very common in children, chronic folliculitis leading to folliculitis decalvans and scarring alopecia. Next is the infestations. The most common is the pediculosis capitis. Pediculosis capitis can affect all the hair bearing areas, sometimes even the eyebrows. Very common in uh, school children, especially the female children, and uh, it is very easy, very easily treatable. And uh, with one uh, tablet of ivermectin, uh, all the lice can be killed. So it has become a very easily treatable problem, and we don't see uh, uh, infestations very commonly as we see uh, as we saw when we were doing our uh, post graduation. The most common alopecia in children is alopecia areata, autoimmune alopecia. It is a genetically determined autoimmune patchy hair loss on any hair bearing site with pathognomonic exclamation markers. These exclamation markers can be very easily seen with a triposcope on the patches. The, uh, when the alopecia areata usually starts in childhood, uh, it has got a very bad prognosis. It is usually recurrent and most of the uh, Alopecia areata occurs in atopic children, 50 to 75 percent, and also it is very common in Down syndrome. syndrome. Uh, when, it, uh, when it occurs and it uh, appears in childhood, it easily progresses to alopecia totalis and alopecia universalis, and it has got a little worse uh, prognosis. Uh, it is also the common cause of brain in children. It is associated with uh, autoimmune paroditis, sometimes. Uh, there is uh, increased occurrence of antithyroid antibodies. Uh, nail changes are common. When you see a lot of nail changes in an alopecia areata child, uh, the uh, prognosis is going to be a little uh, guarded. And uh, oophiasis is the uh, alopecia areata occurring in the margins of the scalp. And oophiasis also is not a, a sign of So these are the patches of alopecia areata. You can see the ex exclamation mark hairs, even without a trichoscopy, with a um, good amount of uh, macro photography, the digital photography, or the photographs that you take with your uh, mobile phone itself. Uh, when you enlarge it and when you zoom it, you can see the uh, exclamation mark hairs. So classical alopecia data. Most of these cases of alopecia data are uh, mistreated or uh, um, treated by the, by the friends and family at home by some irritant application like onion juice, garlic, and some herbal applications. And it ends up becoming a scarring alopecia. We found a lot of, uh, we found a series of cases in a quackery center where this uh, alopecia rita was converted to scarring alopecia by applying a seed of this proton tiglium. This, uh, in Tamil, it is called nervalam. It is available for just two rupees. It's supposed to be a very poisonous seed um, and it is used as uh, for this uh, irritating the alopecia data patches. It is just rubbed on the floor and the oil is applied on the scalp. It produces severe pustular reaction and uh, it produces a scarring alopecia. Sometimes when it is applied in very uh, minimal quantities, it regrows hair. That is why it has gained some uh, popularity, but most of the cases it uh, leads to scarring alopecia. This is an alopecia areata, which usually follows a reticulate pattern. Alopecia areata, the two uh, round patches uh, and the many round patches join together and they form a reticulate pattern. And it becomes slowly becomes, it uh, involves the entire scalp, it becomes alopecia totalis. Then it uh, involves the eyebrows and the body hair. Uh, when uh, the, uh, all the hairs in the body are removed, it is called alopecia universalis. So alopecia areata, then multiple reticulate alopecia areata, then ophiatic alopecia areata, then alopecia totalis, alopecia universalis, where all the hair is lost. The very close differential diagnosis for alopecia areata is trichotillomania. Trichotillomania is a obsessive compulsive disorder where it is, uh, it is also listed in the diagnostics and the statistical manual of mental disorders. Um, where the child repeatedly rolls and then suddenly pulls the hair and to create a patch like this. 
So this is a very interesting uh, condition. It is very common in children and uh, children who are especially under stress. We uh, did a study of about 37 children. We, we, we found that most of these children are under very severe stress and most of these children are in, uh, put into stress by the mother. Uh, the uh, mothers were putting a lot of pressure uh, to get the first rank in the school or to study well. And uh, these children, um, this is a kind of uh, frustration. They do not uh, uh, know how to express the anger and they start pulling the hair. This is what we observed in our study. And um, most of them had, uh, had this uh, focused pulling and uh, they were pulling automatically while watching TV and uh, reading some books uh, all the, or they even uh, pretend to read some books and sometimes they keep on pulling the hair. You can see a lot of hairs around uh, in the place of their uh, seating. You, you have to take, uh, take a detailed history and you have to talk to the patient, talk to the child separately and along with the pair, uh, parents to elicit the history of uh, this uh, trichotillomania. Sometimes the children may not reveal or accept that they are pulling the hair. Uh, those cases we may have to do, do a biopsy to prove that. Bizarre patterns of patches can appear and uh, it, the, the, these children can pull the hair not only from the scalp, also from the eyebrows and eyelashes. You can, uh, even in alopecia areata, when, uh, when these children have alopecia areata, after the alopecia areata is resolving or uh, when it is regrowing, they keep on examining the patch and in that process, they also start pulling the hair. So sometimes trichotillomania is associated with uh, alopecia areata. And they also, uh, this child has pulled all the eyelashes. She has already pulled the eyebrows and now she's pulling the eyelashes. There's a symmetrical pattern of trichotillomania. This child has created a symmetrical pattern. Most of these children having this trichotillomania are very perfect in their pulling and they create a very symmetrical and bizarre or a very figurative patterns, like a triangular pattern or a square pattern and some bizarre patterns. This child uh, lost her, uh, lost his father, and uh, he's, uh, he was very close to the father, and he started imitating the father's uh, hairstyle by pulling the hair. He's just an eight-year-old uh, boy. He started pulling the hair in a typical pattern so that he could resemble his father, at least in the picture, because he was missing the father. This is a very severe form of trichotillomania. It's called Freyer tuck sign. And this also can be easily treated with proper counseling. Uh, in this child, I had to do a biopsy where I could see this uh, follicular plugging and the pigment casts, which are very important for the diagnosis of this. Uh, you can see the pigment casts in the histopathology. This is a new condition called trichotillomania. Trichotillomania is to pull the hair, but trichotillomania is to rub and remove the hair. Children, uh, they rub with the palmar surface of the index finger or sometimes the palm, and they constantly keep rubbing it, and then they remove the hair like this. This is a very typical linear pattern of this trichotillomania. This is the first Asian case report we published in 2005. This is trichotemnomania. Temno means to cut. This child has playfully cut with the scissors, and he has used some sharp instruments like blades to create a patch of baldness over here. Sometimes they also try to imitate uh, film stars and they start pulling it in that uh, pattern to create a pattern uh, of their uh, favorite film stars hairstyle. Sometimes it's called trichotil, there is no mania. Children playfully start pulling the hair. It gives a uh, sort of pleasure because in trichotillomania there is an impulse to pull the hair. But here there is a pleasure after pulling the hair. There's a smile, uh, um, kind of a mild uh, sensation which gives them an excitement, they start pulling the hair. So this is trichotil, this is a habitual playful pulling of hair, very easy to treat. When you explain to the uh, patients and uh, caution the parents, uh, they easily stop that. They respond very well to counseling. Then the malnutritional alopecia. These are the third most common cause of uh, alopecia in children. Most of the children uh, that we see in our practice have this uh, malnutritional alopecia. Children come with a diffuse thinning of uh, uh, hair all over the scalp. There is a profound hair shedding. They often present as acute and chronic telogen effluvium. And uh, most of 
prevent they have these anxious and panic mothers and uh, most of them have malnutrition or malabsorption and industrialized malabsorption like eating junk food and crash dieting most of them have iron deficiency which is very common still in children calcium deficiency uh, protein energy malnutrition zinc deficiency biotin deficiency vitamin b12 and vitamin d deficiency these children have thinning of hair not only have thinning of hair but also have uh, lightening of the hair and most of the children have or under severe stress. So you could have seen many children coming with a head full of hair and also a hand full of hair. This is the typical presentation of chronic telogen effluvium. You just have to reassure them that, the, that all the hair will regrow because it is only a, a nutritional deficiency or a, a slight hair cycle alteration or maybe a slight hormonal imbalance which is sitting in because of the puberty. And this all the hair which is fallen will grow back. Because once a telogen hair is fallen, is pushed out, that, that is the anagen hair which is pushing it out. So there is a growing hair which is pushing out the resting hair. So this reassurance will uh, definitely bring in uh, cheer on the patient's face. So this is a classical sign of uh, chronic telogen effluvium. You have a bitemporal thinning, even in female patients, like the androgenetic alopecia, you have a temporal thinning. This is the sign of uh, telogen effluvium. See, th this is mainly because the nutritional deficiency, you can also see there is lightening of color. The hair has become mostly brown and uh, lighter uh, brown, golden brown in color. There are various colors of hair because of the protein deficiency and vitamin deficiency and uh, deficiency of minerals. This is a traction locusia. Many children we have seen uh, Others and even children are fond of this traction hairstyle because of this tight traction, which is put for a very long time, more than 12 hours in a day, then this area becomes a scar. Simple traction itself can lead to a uh, scarring alopecia. You can uh, see the scarring alopecia is developed over here and also in the occipital area and also in the sides of the scalp, wherever the traction is applied for a very long time. So we have to advise them to have a loose hairstyle. These are the cast. Some children who, have, who are having very severe seborrheic dermatitis and inflammatory scalp conditions may develop this very pilar cast. And in a, in the, uh, we have a custom of not washing the hair very regularly. And uh, children usually wash it uh, once, uh, once a week or twice a week because they have to get up and go to the school in the early morning. Most of the children don't wash the hair. So we have to ask them to uh, wash the hair very regularly and repeatedly, at least once uh, daily in the um, hair wash should be advised or at least uh, once in two days uh, the hair wash should be advised. These casts can ap appear on the hair. These should be differentiated from the nits because casts can be easily removed from the hair but nits cannot be removed easily from the hair. This is a new condition called acquired partial curly hair. This is a localized condition. You would have seen some children complaining that some hairs are becoming uh, very rough and wavy and curly, uh, while the rest of the hair is normal. This is also due to hair shaft weathering and uh, sometimes due to uh, unknown causes, but usually it returns to normal by itself. And androgenetic alopecia is becoming very common in children. And uh, we have seen many cases of androgenetic alopecia even under the age of 12 and 10. And uh, this is a very strong family history. More than androgen, there is a genetic factor and very common in female children than in uh, male children. And more of female pattern hair loss than male pattern hair loss because it doesn't follow a particular pattern. There, are, there is increased levels of DHEs because the, uh, the androgen stimulation is from the adrenals, uh, not from the ovaries or the uh, testes. It is important to remember the androgenetic lepicia also can appear in, uh, appear in young children and to identify this. Uh, it is very uh, useful for us to practice. Then we come to the pigmentary disorders of the scalp. We have this uh, Griselli and Brunera syndrome. This is a genetic condition which is very rare. And you can see uh, the uh, complete silvery hair of this child. This can be differentiated from the Shidiac Igashi syndrome only by polarized light microscopy. These are very rare. Even simple seborrheic dermatitis can lead to graying of hair. So washing of hair every day with a ketoconazole shampoo or an uh, antifungal shampoo, or even with a normal shampoo can reduce the dandruff and control the dandruff and reduce the perifollicular microinflammation, which could be the first pathogenic event for the androgenic alopecia as well as the graying of hair. 
you would have you would have seen the hair changes in quashier hair protein energy malnutrition you see the fine and sparse hair reddish brown tinge and the flax sign so we'll see how protein energy malnutrition leads to hair color change so these are uh, some uh, older children who had gone for this bariatric surgery we had a series of cases and after the bariatric surgery they developed this uh, hair color change and also diffuse hair loss this is because in the melanin cycle melanin pathway you need this l cysteine to convert new few melanin to u melanin we you know that there are two types of melanin u melanin which gives the black color the few melanin which gives red color so in the absence of cysteine in the absence of cysteine due to protein energy malnutrition the melanin pathway shifts to few melanin instead of u melanin so the hair becomes reddish brown and finally they end up becoming a blonde so this is a post bariatric surgery uh, hair color change which uh, teaches us that protein is very important to uh, keep the uh, hair color intact then the pediatric hirsutism hirsutism is very common because many children are uh, obese now and uh, they have insulin resistance and we have this hirsutism even in children even under the age of uh, uh, 12 and sometimes even the age of 16 we have seen uh, pediatric hirsutism and most of the children have pcos and acanthosis indicans and girls born with low birth weight are more prone for pcos and increase androgen uh, hyperandrogenism hyperinsulinemia is insulinemia is very common and um, intake of anabolic steroids is also very common in western children and cocaine addiction is very common in western children so this has to be identified and this could be a clue for the abnormal ovarian tumors also sometimes so it's all okay but when you can we all uh, grow hair on the scalp that is what is the question of uh, patients the little patients yes even congenital hypotrichosis can be uh, treated and you can regrow hair to some extent with the l-cysteine supplementation and noxidil topical noxidil up to 2% can be used and it definitely gives very good results sometimes oral retinoids also help and you can see uh, the results of this uh, child which we saw a little earlier again this at least to some extent the hair thickness improves hair density improves the hair color changes so their uh, confidence improves the hair care for this fragile hair for uh, children having this congenital uh, hypotrichosis and very weak and brittle hair should be like this uh, they have to uh, wash the hair at least twice a week and uh, they have to use a shampoo with a double conditioners and they have to use some uh, separate conditioners also after washing with the shampoo and they have to use a leave in uh, conditioners and like uh, oils like your uh, vegetable oil should be applied after wash because we have a strange habit of uh, applying the oil and then taking wash so the oil should be applied only after hair wash and uh, vigorous rubbing of the hair should be avoided with a towel to dry the hair because 50% of the moisture on the hair should be, should be absorbed by the hair shaft then only the hair will be uh, having the moisture we are having the retained moisture no hair dryers and no hot combs and no brushes should be advised and the hair comb should be white toothed and we have to avoid all the hair dressing procedures we have to protect the hair from excessive exposure to sunlight by wearing a scarf and loose hair style should be advised and no uh, clips and uh, tight uh, plate should be uh, advised and uh, it is always better to advise them to use a satin pillow to ease the reduction of uh, uh, friction while sleeping because that can easily remove the hair Treatment of tinea capitis has been very well elaborated by Dr. Madhu, and uh, terbinafine is very helpful in uh, trichomycosis. Sometimes trichomycosis also, and sometimes in resistant cases we use bisulfonamide. And most of these cases we have to always combine with the ketoconazole shampoo. Even in androgenic alopecia or tinea capitis or any type of hair loss, washing the hair every day with a two uh, percent ketoconazole shampoo uh, is definitely a value addition to the treatment. So alopecia areata, most of the patches, single patches, spontaneously resolve. You just have to give reassurance and uh, give supportive therapy like vitamins and minerals and uh, give some uh, nutritional supplementation. Topical puasol also really helps. Uh, apply, applying a 
uh, photosensitization and exposure to exposing to sunlight. Topical midpotent steroids with or without 3% salicylic acid. Topical tacroid is also very useful. But I often use this liquid nitrogen cryotherapy. Most of the children with uh, uh, multiple patches of alopecia areata do very well with the liquid nitrogen cryotherapy, which is very safe and uh, very, uh, it gives very promising results. And uh, systemic PUA sometimes is useful in extensive alopecia areata. Intralational triamcinolone can be given in older children, but we have to restrict to 2.5 to 5 milligrams per ml. We should not use the 10 milligram per ml. And now the oral tofacitinib is the wonder drug in dermatology. It has become a very useful drug in alopecia areata. Most of the children do very well with oral tofacitinib. It has been by, uh, found to be very safe, but we have to rule out um, uh, tuberculosis and other immunocompromised disorders in children before giving tofacitinib. If they are okay for all that, then we can give this tofacitinib and 0.15 mg per kg per day for three months. Uh, gives wonderful results in alopecia areata. And contact immunotherapy is very useful with uh, Diphenciprone, DPCP, which is very useful for uh, in alopecia areata for older children. Oral steroids should never be given in alopecia areata. We, we always tend to give uh, many uh, Dermatologists and other general practitioners tend to give oral steroids for alopecia areata. But alopecia areata is, is a, we all know that it is a recurrent uh, 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 problem. It is going to be recurrent even if you give oral steroids. So it is better not to give, uh, load with oral steroids and spoil the system and uh, treat only with non steroidal medications. And oral cyclosporin is also not very useful and not recommended to children. This is a patch of ophiasis in alopecia areata. This child we treated with uh, liquid nitrogen cryotherapy and she has responded very well. Within one session, hair started regrowing, which is very safe. This is a case of alopecia totalis, complete loss of hair over the scalp, a little bit on the eyebrows left. This boy was about 15 years when he saw me. So we decided to do the DPCP immunotherapy, create a window uh, first on the oxygen area sensitized by applying 2% DPCP diphenciprone. And from after two weeks, you start applying DPCP in uh, concentrations starting from 0.001% uh, for about uh, one year. Every two weeks, you have to keep applying all over the scalp. This works by providing contracting immunity to the lymphocytic infiltrate around the hair bulb. It removes the lymphocytic infiltrate by the contracting uh, immunities. That is why it is called immunotherapy. This boy has started regrowing the hair after three months, after six months. And by about one year, he was almost completely the alopecia totalis was resolved. This is with the first genetic. This child has very, uh, very, uh, uh, done extremely well with uh, the first I just gave five milligrams per day for three months. And we are just uh, following it up and it has not recurred so far. I showed you a frayer tuck sign of trichotillomania, very severe and uh, tough uh, case of uh, trichotillomania where the child was uh, simulating the father's androgenetic alopecia by pulling the hair all over the scalp, all over the vertex. With simple uh, counseling and a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors to control his depression, all the hair regrew within a few months. So counseling is very important in uh, treating children with hair loss. This is a trichotil or a trichotillomania without any mania habitual hair pulling, uh, just simple counseling as we go on the hair. Premature canitis due to nutritional deficiency, iron deficiency, vitamin B2 deficiency, and calcium deficiency. Um, it just supplements, it's completely reversed. Thank you, Indian Academy of Pediatrics to chapter. Thank you so much for the patience.
Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. That was a very elaborate presentation and all these problems, uh, I think they belong to both adults and the children. And there were new uh, entities that you introduced to us. Um, so there's one question from one of the participants who wants to know the reason behind the uh, uh, exclamatory mark sign and the countability sign in alopecia areata, sir. Yeah, alopecia areata, the, the lymphocytic infiltrate specifically affects the hair bulb area. So it just affects the hair root, uh, just about uh, a few millimeters above the, hair, above the hair root. So the inflammatory infiltrate first damages that area. The, that is why you get the codability sign. The, uh, the, just above the root, you get the thinning of the hair or the narrowing of the hair. At that point, it breaks. So you get the dysplastic hairs. When you do a trichoscopic trichogram, you can see the codability and then the hair breaks just above the root and it is not completely gone. Alpiciator, that is why it is reversible. The hair root is the hair follicle or the hair bulb, it is not completely affected. It's the lymphocytic infiltrate which affects the hair root or the hair bulb. It, um, uh, it affects, it, uh, it uh, makes the hair uh, cut off from just above the root. So the remaining portion of the hair follicle or the stub of the hair is seen as the exclamation mark here. So that is why alopecia areata, when you give anti-inflammatory treatment, it is reversible. And again, when the inflammation comes, it is uh, it recurs. Thank you, sir. You were very clear. Um, and alopecia areata also specifically affects the antigen hairs in antigen 2 and 3. It affects only the pigmented hairs. The gray hairs are spared in alopecia areata. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, another participant wants to know the treatment for head lice in a three-month-old child. Is that uh, that common, sir? If the mother has lice, then the so, child also can have. And, you know, it is very common in the lower socioeconomic uh, conditions. But if it is the, if the child is only three months old, then you can only give topical uh, permethrin lotions. Ivermectin cannot be, I don't think it can be given. But you, you are the best judges to so if that is the case, what percentage can be used, sir? Like, uh, what percentage of permethrin? One percent permethrin can be used even in children. Oh, even in young infants. Yeah. Even even simple washing of the hair every day uh, can remove the uh, lice infestation in very young children. It is very common in our country, in our uh, place, because they don't wash the hair. Yes, sir. thank you, sir. Sir, another question. Uh, um, is it uh, true that uh, climatic conditions do play a role in hair fall and all that stuff? When it's a common belief, is that so? Normal hair growth is more in summer and less in winter. But in summer, when you have a lot of uh, sweating and dandruff, then androgenetic alopecia and uh, fungal infections, seborrheic dermatitis, these are all common. So in summer, there is a uh, uh, increase in hair loss than in the winter. But it is uh, completely the reverse in the Western countries. But uh, that is essentially reversible, sir. This hair fall is uh, due to climate. Is reversible if you find out the, if you know the cause and the type of the hair loss and the causes can be, uh, if you can find out the cause and treat the cause, most of the hair loss is reversible. Like I just showed you even canine lipotrichosis is reversible and treatable. Thank you so much, sir. You have given us a lot of practical tips also. And uh, thank you so much. The audience must have had a very good time. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, accepting our invite and uh, giving us a very valuable topic. Thank you, sir. Um, we'll now move to the next speaker. Professor Dr. Karthikeyan, sir to deliver his talk on skin disorders in newborn. Professor Dr. Karthikeyan is the head of the department of dermatology and STD at uh, Sri Manakula Vinayagar Medical College. And he's the dean of academics too. He's a uh, JIPMA right. And um, he's published more than 200 papers in uh, national and international journals and has delivered lots of uh, lectures in zonal and national conferences. He's um, authored chapters 
on scabies in IADVL uh, textbook of dermatology and his articles have been referenced in uh, many prominent uh, dermatology textbooks and he's a member of the research committee of uh, JIPMER and a core member of the MEU and his areas of interest include um, pediatric dermatology and tropical dermatology and uh, he's uh, presently the associate editor of International Journal of Trichology, reviewer for the European Journal of uh, Dermatology Venereology and um, Post Dermatology PG Manual, uh, past president of uh, Pondicherry branch of uh, Indian Academy of Dermatology Venereology and Leprosy. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much for accepting the invite, sir. A pleasant good evening to everyone. I think uh, uh, after uh, two eminent speakers, it is uh, a good job to start with the uh, type of dermatosis, which is very unique. Those neonates who are very susceptible to dermatological infections. I'll be talking today on neonatal skin physiology and certain common neonatal dermatosis and certain interesting points to differentiate these dermatosis. So mine will be addressed primarily to a, a pediatrician level. I, I'm not going into too much of uh, pathogenesis and other features. I'm primarily talking about the clinical features, the hints and important points for diagnosis and basics in management. So a neonatal skin is a different type of skin from that of an adult and even for that matter, different from that of a child. It's a sudden transition from the sterile environment to a dry one with pathogens. The, they are in the amniotic fluid, floating in the amniotic fluid, nourished by the amniotic fluid and from the nutrition derived from the mother. So from that environment, suddenly you come into the external environment, which is very dry and filled with pathogens and uh, allergens. So it's a dramatic challenge to the newborn to adapt to the normal environment. And what happens, the skin is also not mature enough. The skin is very thin and the basement layer is not well matured. And so what happens, all these things predispose the neonatal skin to mechanical damage as well as chemical irritation. And most of the time we see these neonates are subjected to the soaps or the environmental challenges like an adult. So they can absolutely not withstand that and many of them develop skin disorders. And so the intact epidermal barrier is very, very important. We have to maintain the barrier to prevent physical injury and to prevent transepidermal water loss and protect it from infection. Because this skin the transepidermal water loss or what we call as insensible water loss is very, very high. And this, we never bother about or think about this type of water loss. And moreover, the physical injury due to friction, handling, so-called massaging, all these things can damage the skin of a neonate. So the skin is, when the child is born, the skin is filled with vernix caseosa. And vernix caseosa is, you see, it's a good mixture of uh, water, proteins, and lipids. And usually we don't uh, wash, ask them to wash it immediately, allow it to remain for some time and then slowly remove it. Because it has a hydrating property, it has uh, antimicrobial property and also has, uh, prevents uh, it from being get skin getting dried. So the, the general practice is immediately they remove vernis caseosa completely and give a bath is not advised. It's better to leave it for some time. Then we go on to the disorders. Uh, we classify these disorders in a different way. That is transient disorders, which are self-limiting and they disappear within a short span of one to two weeks. And the other group common is infections because we, I already told you the neonatal skin is highly susceptible for infections. So we'll talk about the viral, bacterial, fungal and parasitic infections which can occur on skin and how do they manifest. There are some basic principles you should understand in uh, neonatal skin. I already told you that the neonatal skin is immature and not very well developed. So when it's underdeveloped, the skin is underdeveloped, what happens? The basement layer is not very well formed. So any lesion on the neonatal skin, it will form only blisters because the neonatal skin, is the dermis and the epidermis are not attached very tightly. So any lesion will produce only a blister. So the most common type of lesions you see in neonates are blistering disorders or what we call vesicles and pustules. So first we'll talk about what are the causes of this pustular eruption because 
we find it very commonly in children, pustules, sudden eruption of pustules. And we are at loss to find out what it could be. It could be a bacterial cause. It could be most commonly staph, uh, cephalococcus, a fungal etiology like candidiasis, a viral etiology like herpes simplex or varicella, a parasitic like that of scabies, or it can be rare disorders like histiocytosis and incontinentia pigmenta. Histiocytosis usually presents in localized areas and is a very rare condition, while incontinentia pigmenta is genetically inherited condition where you find linear, linear streaks of vesicles and these vesicles which later uh, heal and typically this is seen in uh, male infants only. So the reactive phenomenon like malaria, transient neonatal pustular melanosis, erythema toxicum, isnophilic folliculitis, neonatal acne, as well as acropustulosis. They are reactive phenomenon and many of them are transient and they may subside on their own. And what are the causes of vesicular bullous eruptions? I've given a detail of it about the infections. There are hereditary causes like epidermolysis bullosa, we not go into the details of epidermolysis bullosa. Usually it presents with bullae in the palms and soles. And there are various variants of it. Incontinentia pigmenta, I just now told you. Gall syndrome and certain porphyrias. Similarly, in immune mediated like dermatitis herpetiformis, epidermolysis bullosa acquisita, bullus elli, IgA dermatosis, bullus femfigoid and femfigus vulgaris. All of them, if the mother has these disorders, it's a very high ch chance of the uh, neonate developing it. Probably one of the most commonly uh, seen neonatal dermatosis, erythema toxicum neonatorum. It's benign and self-limiting. All of us know about that. The immunological cutaneous reaction to probable microbial colonization of the hair follicles. And the rash usually starts within two to three days after birth. It starts with erythematous macules with central papule or pustule. Multiple lesions, they occur at the crops, face, trunk, and proximal extremities are seen. But they are evanescent crops, they wax and wane and resolve in a few days. Actually, no treatment is required, but if the mother is very anxious, you can give them mild emollients to the skin. But we always know it is a transient and a lesion will subside on its own and usually asymptomatic. The other one is a neonatal pustular dermatosis. Uh, this is a vesicular pustular rash. What happens here very typically when it ruptures, it forms brown macules with colorate of scales and heals with uh, brown pigmented macules. It affects the neck, face, palms and soles. Even this type of lesions usually heal with three to four weeks. Probably the only problem in neonatal pustular dermatosis is the pigmentation we see. It is less common than the erythema toxicum neonatorum. The lesions are like this. On the face, you have these lesions. And they are very typically seen as pustules. Uh, if you want, you can do a, a smear out of it and find out what are the types of inflammatory cells. So here we typically find neutrophils in case of transient neonatal pustular dermatosis. Then the infections, which you are going to discuss about is herpes, cytomegalovirus, varicella, enteroviral infections, as well as staphylococcal, a neonatal impetigo, cellulitis, omphalitis, and neonatal abscess, candidiasis, petreus versicolor, and scabies. Herpes simplex infection, it's due to perinatal infection in first four to six weeks of life. You find vesicles or petechiae and dissemination with high mortality. Obviously, you find lesions in the mother's external genitalia. So it's paramount importance for the gynecologist when they observe herpes lesions uh, just before the delivery to make adequate precautions. And most of the time, the infection all easily spreads to the child and you have to treat the child accordingly. If there are active lesions in the mother at the time of delivery, the neonate invariably develops herpes simplex infection and it is disseminated. So it has to be treated with parental acyclovir. You can have this photograph of a disseminated herpes simplex infection. You can do a smear of this vesicle which is seen on the face and the trunk and you find the giant cells. At this point of mother, uh, point I have certain points to remember particularly with regard to the uh, gestational. I'm talking here about uh, herpes zoster or what we call varicella. I'm not talking about the herpes simplex infection. Herpes simplex infection occurs only at the time of 
uh, delivery. Here we are talking about herpes zoster, which is a disseminated infection or what you call varicella zoster. So varicella sorry zoster, to interrupt, sir. Uh, your yes. screen is not visible, sir. Is it visible now? Excuse me, is it visible now? Sir, it's not visible, sir. One moment. One moment. Yes, sir. Give me some time. Yes, is it sir, visible now? Yeah, sir, it's visible now. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, so, um, can it be uh, made in the slide share mode, sir? S slide, slide show. Share. One minute. Is it visible now? Yes, sir. Very much, okay. sir. Thank you, Thank sir. You. Thank you. Okay. Okay. This is a disseminated herpes zoster, herpes simplex infection. And now I'll go to the next topic that is. about uh, chicken pox. And this is a very important point to remember about chicken pox. The period of gestation of the infected mother, if it is between seven to 28 weeks, the outcome in fetus is a fetal varicella syndrome. So I'll be talking about it a bit later, the fetal varicella syndrome. If the period of gestation is between one to 28 weeks, the outcome is a neonatal or childhood herpes zoster. If the infection is between two weeks before delivery, it is neonatal chicken pox. And five days before or after delivery, you get neonatal disseminated chicken pox with septicemia or, and there is an increased mortality. So this is a very important point which you remember when the mother develops varicella or chicken pox. So the earlier the infection, we know the virus can be teratogenic and it can produce features such as the fetal varicella syndrome. Otherwise, later in the pregnancy, they develop neonatal chicken pox. So this is a very interesting case of a scar. The child presents with a scar at birth. There are various differential diagnoses for the scar at birth. You can see the scar on the leg. And this is a very interesting case of uh, uh, fetal varicella syndrome. And what are the other causes of this type of uh, skin hypoplasia or scar is aplasia cutis congenita, epidermolysis bullosa, neonatal LE, focal dermal hypoplasia, antenatal procedures like amniocentesis, forceps delivery, etc. Congenital erosive and vesicular dermatosis, which heal with uh, reticulate scarring. So these are the conditions should be remembered with, when the child presents with scar. And fetal varicella syndrome is very important cause, like aplasia cutis congenita. So these are the other conditions where you find a scar or congenital absence of skin. They remember, resemble the same in a neonate. About varicella, I just now told you, it's perinatal transmission and the hematogenous or airborne route, the mother gets infected as well as the child. Prodrome, fever, upper respiratory symptoms. One week later, small red macules to papules, vesicle and pustules on erythematous base. They are polymorphous in morphology and they crust in one to three days. And treatment is within 72 hours, you can give varicella zoster aminoglobulin and then parenteral acyclovir depending upon the weight of the child. And this is a case of the, we had a case of neonatal varicella. You can see the 
lesions, the vesicles, and uh, the hands, the trunk, and uh, this is the neonatal varicella. So the next another important condition which presents as pustular eruption is due to staph aureus infection. It presents the second or third day of life. It manifests as vesicles to pustules on an erythematous base. Sometimes you find even large bulla, that is when it becomes more of a, a bullous lesion. And honeycomb crust forms when these bulla rupture and heal. And you find that in intertigenous areas also. The cytology will give the diagnosis. You do a gram strain, you see positive cocaine clusters. And many a time topical muparosin is good. But if the infection is disseminated or extensive or with fever and lymphadenopathy, then you can start on systemic antibiotics. This is a photograph which shows the pustular lesions in case of a staph infection. And another important condition, uh, a condition which can be uh, sometimes lethal is staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome, also called as Ritter's disease. It is due to the uh, exfoliative exotoxin, which is produced by the staphylococcus aureus uh, organism, and it spreads through circulation and involves the entire skin, usually second to third day of life. Starts as a pustule, becomes a flaccid bulla with yellow fluid, and erosions then with cholerate of scales. And what happens, the whole skin can get involved. But the classical feature is skin tenderness, which is a hallmark of staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome. The child has an incessant and painful cry when you touch the skin. So that skin tenderness and a positive Nikolsky sign are two important hallmarks of uh, staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome. So the skin peels off because of the exfoliative toxin and you get a positive Nikolsky sign along with pain. The fluid and electrolyte balance is very important, topical muparosin and systemic antibiotics, cephalosporin or vancomycin, depending upon the organisms. So this is a condition where you find the staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome child, uh, neonate, where the skin uh, just peels off and uh, Nikolsky sign is positive. Child is very irritable and uh, sick and so it has to be managed appropriately. We have various degrees. Some people have very localized or few areas only you have staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome. Some children have fluorid. It depends upon the amount of uh, toxin produced. And this is a disease exclusively seen in uh, neonates, young children, because they are not able to excrete the exfoliative toxin from their uh, body and because the kidney is not mature enough to excrete the toxin. That's why they develop. Adults usually do not develop um, staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome. If adults develop, then probably they have a uh, renal disease. Candidiasis is another important condition caused by Candida albicans within one to two weeks of life. The most important manifestation of Candidiasis is oral thrush and perianal napkin dermatitis. So napkin dermatitis is a very common problem, presents as pustules, vesicles, or an erythematous base surrounded by satellite lesions. The hallmark of cutaneous can, uh, the napkin dermatitis produced by candidiasis is satellite lesions. So you find multiple pustules around the lesions. And interregenous and perianal area are involved. KOH mount shows pseudo hyphae and spores. Antifungal therapy for 7 to 10 days will be useful. And you can see this uh, very typically uh, multiple lesions. And you can see the satellite pustules here. Here also you can see the satellite pustules satellite lesions. And oral thrush, a pseudomembrane formation, white plaques over the buccal mucosa and tongue. Uh, it is usually a benign condition and it uh, self-limiting condition. Uh, old time-tested therapy is in violet paint and clotrimazole mount paint. Mostly they are enough to treat oral thrush. Topical nystatin is also effective in management of oral thrush. Neonatal candidiasis is one condition which is you find disseminated pustules all over the body. And to differentiate this from uh, congenital candidiasis is a very important point. Congenital candidiasis is rare. Uh, neonatal candidiasis is more common. Most of the time, if you find a candidiasis, it's due to neonatal candidiasis. Acquisition is in utero in case of congenital candidiasis. And neonatal candidiasis antepartum or postpartum. Cord may show yellowish plaques in case of uh, congenital candidiasis. And uh, cord is normal in neonatal candidiasis. Onset within six days of life and neonatal candidiasis more than six days after birth. So the sites are back, skin folds, palms, soles, and uh, oral and napkin area are commonly spared in congenital candidiasis. 
oral napkin area are typically involved in neonatal candidiasis because the primary set of involved, site of involvement. And congenital candidiasis produce generalized erythematous macules, papules, pustules on erythematous base. Here in neonatal candidiasis, it's more of a beefy red color with moist appearance, scalloped outlines, and satellite pustules are seen in neonatal candidiasis. So both of them are candidiasis with a better prognosis in case of a neonatal candidiasis when compared to congenital candidiasis, which can have a poorer prognosis. And the, another important topic, probably very important condition, which all of us should know is scabies. Uh, Sarcoptes scabii, the mite which causes scabies. You find multiple papules, vesicles, vesicular burrows, and typically palms, soles, and face are involved. This is very, very important in children because palm is involved and face is also involved. And most of the time, they are misdiagnosed as atopic dermatitis or sometimes papular attic area. Eczematization is very common in children because they rub it and uh, skin is also very sensitive. So in neonates, you find an eczematized skin with lesions and palms and soles. You should think of scabies. And the most important clues are genitalia is always involved. So you always check the genitalia and see the genitalia. It's a male child. It's very easy to diagnose. The scrotum and penis has multiple lesions. And palms and soles are also involved. And always ask the mother has scabies. So invariably, in most of the conditions, the, if you suspect scabies, the mother also has scabies. You can see the uh, lesions in the mother or at least history of itching in the mother. You can demonstrate the mite, egg, feces in the KOH mount from the scraping. And 5% permethrin can be used two applications one week apart. If you feel the, the child is too young, less than one week or just newborn, uh, very young, you can use 1% permethrin also. And that is also useful for treating uh, scabies. Sulfur ointment is the recommended agent, but many a time sulfur ointment is not available and it's very tough to get sulfur ointment. But never forget to treat the mother. The most important mistake done by a lot of people is they treat the child and never treat the mother. Obviously, a ping pong infection is going to occur again from the mother and the child is going to present with scabies again and again. So most of the time when they, you can, you think it is not responding to permethrin and it will be a big problem. When we, people apply steroids, it becomes steroid incognito and it becomes a complicated uh, infection. Here you can find uh, neonatal scabies. You can find that typical scabetic lesions, okay? The face, the trunk, and that it can be managed. And you find the palms and soles also, the scabetic lesions. Thank you. I will uh, like to thank the Tamil Nadu Association of uh, Pediatricians who have given me a chance to share a few points about uh, scabies uh, and other common uh, neonatal dermatosis. And neonatal dermatosis are a unique group of disorders which uh, day in and day out you have to manage. And many a times uh, the management sometimes becomes complicated and many a times they are self-limiting. That is the biggest advantage. But it is most important to recognize the complicated problems and to early, ma early ma manage these complicated issues if they are present. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for that uh, useful and elaborate presentation on disorders, uh, skin disorders in newborn. And you have given us very valuable points. Uh, I I am very sure that it would have benefited all the pediatricians, particularly the PGs who were, who have attended the uh, talk. And uh, it's a very good take home point that uh, scabies, um, like in children, even in newborn, if it happens, you'll have to treat the immediate caregiver, the mother. Um, thank you very much, sir. We uh, do not have any questions in the chat box. So uh, one question about the collodion baby and the harlequin fetus, like uh, and though they're very rare, we rare, see yes, them yes, in yes. Um, newborn units. Uh, do they actually um, kind of survey well, sir? Collodion baby and harlequin fetus are quite different. Collodion baby is more common. Harlequin fetus is very rare. Probably you see in big institute, maybe once or twice in your lifetime, you see harlequin fetus. And most of them do not survive in Indian setup because it is... Uh, total uh, ma maintenance of parental nutrition and they are very susceptible and the treat uh, treatment also becomes very tough. While collodion baby is self-limiting, it's just the collodion membrane which occurs. So when you see the baby when it's delivered itself, it is in a 
uh, membrane structure. It's enclosed membrane structure. And most of the time, you just give moisturizers and emollients. The membrane, just like that, uh, ruptures. Then he's. But what happens? Collodion babies are always to be followed up. Uh, very rarely, uh, they just subside. Most of them result into some other type of ichthyosis, like a lamellar ichthyosis or uh, many of the ichthyosiform syndromes like Refsum syndrome, Jogren Larsen. So it, they have to be followed up. Collodion babies are not to be just like that left. Because initially within a neonatal period and early infancy, they subside. They become, become absolutely normal. Uh, the skin becomes normal. But slowly they start developing the features of ichthyosis. The dryness starts and they develop. So on initial stages, it is hydration and moisturizers. These two can uh, be useful. I didn't include Collada and Baby because I thought it's not so common. It's a bit rarer condition. That's why I didn't want to. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. So though out of topic, like uh, chill, uh, babies with uh, infantile scabies, uh, Norwegian, like uh, how is the prognosis? Like uh, if they develop a newborn period or does it progress? much into a pediatric age group or into beyond that? Or does it subside within infancy, sir? Infancy itself, if you appropriately treat scabies, scabies uh, subsides. If it is Norwegian scabies in infants, it's, uh, neonates is very rare, not reported, but infants it's reported. And if it is reported, probably there is um, underlying immunosuppression. We have to rule out uh, maybe a, a HIV or it can be any of the immunodeficiency disorders. So in that conditions, they can develop a crusted scabies, which can be very severe. Yes, sir. So um, one participant wants to know the treatment for capillary hemangioma in newborn. A capillary hemangioma in newborn, then you have to grade the capillary hemangioma. What site, what they we classify as a high risk and low risk. And the high risk capillary hemangiomas, depending upon the site, like face, uh, neck and this, it has to be managed. So there are various regimens. We can use topical, simple agents like topical timolol, steroids, and they are useful. But in the high-risk area, then you have to go in for uh, systemic treatment. Uh, there are various uh, modalities of treatment. And better, these high-risk cases are managed in a proper uh, ICU setup because they can suddenly develop it's a hemangioma on the face. They can develop respiratory distress and other problems. So that is there. So if it's a not low risk area and away from the face and the limbs, better left alone if it's not causing problem. Or otherwise, topical steroids and the timolol is good enough. It will be good enough. To yes, sir. when it is limited to the skin alone, not skin alone. involving the viscera. The role of uh, retinoic acid in, uh, I mean, in treating collodion babies. Hey, collodion patch. babies need not be treated with retinoic uh, acid retin. Actually, okay. only for... Uh, Harlequin fetus, you have to give acetretin. Because collodion baby, you have to see what they progress into. Because uh, one umbrella condition, collodion baby can progress to anything. Sometimes it is self-healing. They do not develop any disease at all. So we don't start retinoids for a collodion baby. But for Harlequin fetus, definitely we have to start on uh, acetretin. That's the biggest challenge. And how the child responds. And sometimes with retinoids in a neonate, it's high, very risky. A lot of side effects will be there. And the liver function, you have to monitor the liver function. And so it cre creates certain issues. And the therapy itself can be toxic to the child. So that is the issue with the um, uh, halokin fetus. Yes, probably that limits the use of it in uh, resource yeah, limited resource settings. Better, yes, Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for uh, Thank answering you. the questions patiently. Also. Thank, you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move to the next speaker. Professor Dr. Roshni Menon, Madam. Madam is now the Professor and HOD of the Department of uh, Dermatology, Venereology and Leprosy at uh, Sri Venkateshwara Medical College Hospitals and Research Center at Pondicherry. And she is uh, presently the uh, President of the Indian Academy of Dermatology, Venereology and Leprosy of uh, Puducherry Chapter. And she's done her uh, undergraduation at uh, Trishur Medical College, Kerala, and the post-graduation at uh, Ca Calicut Medical College, Kerala. Her special interests include uh, acne, hirsutism, uh, genital dermatosis, and uh, sexually transmitted infections. Uh, Madam has a lot of uh, publications to her credit and has been a prominent speaker in many of the zonal and national conferences. 
uh, over to Madam for her talk on atopic dermatitis in children. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, you're not audible, ma'am. You're muted. Okay, can you hear Thank me? Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, ma'am. Thank yeah. you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Dakshani, for the kind words. Thank you, ma'am. I'll just try to share my screen. <clears throat> Yeah, I think it's visible, no? Ma'am, your screen is visible. Thank you, ma'am. So, uh, let me first of all thank thank all the organizers of this pediatric dermatology CME. Uh, uh, this atopic dermatitis. Uh, it's a chronic disease and it's a real problem in uh, when you come to the real life situation for management in your hospital or in your clinic because because you have to deal with a very uh, like irritable child and a ever anxious parent so it's a it's, it's not that easy to uh, manage this disease uh, so I'll be mostly, you know, this is the time, uh, this is a huge, it's a vast topic and uh, uh, I cannot give uh, justice to within uh, some 30 minutes of presentation. So most, I'll be mostly uh, uh, concentrating on the clinical feature, the two special clinical features, the usual clinical features everybody knows and uh, the management strategies. So uh, I'll be focusing on that. <clears throat> Now, yeah, here you can see three pictures actually. The first picture the, is you can see uh, uh, erythematous plaque with lots of pustules uh, oozing and uh, yellowish crust. And this entire thing is looking angry, isn't it? So this is called an acute eczema. And the second part, second picture is something like a slightly erythematous base, a shiny, slightly edematous skin in the popliteal area. And the third picture, what you are able to see is a chronically irritated skin. That is, actually, you can see the lichenified skin. Lichenified means exaggerated skin markings. So in the nape of the neck as well, which is extending to the uh, lower back also suboccipital to that this is a very common area of lichenification because it's very easy for the child or the patient to scratch that area so <clears throat> here you can see the acute eczema subacute eczema and chronic eczema this is what you see in different stages of atopic dermatitis now uh, atopic dermatitis as you all know we all know it's a chronically relaxing inflammatory skin disease and it can occur at any age but most of mostly it is seen uh, it's more common in uh, children and a percentage around uh, uh, 7 to 10 percentage of the children who had atopy uh, atopic dermatitis progress to the adult stage which is usually a more severe uh, kind of that is whichever whoever has progressed from uh, the uh, child ch childhood stage to adult stage will be having a more of a uh, more of a severe disease but this particular disease can occur at any age. So uh, even a, uh, an adult without much history in the childhood can also develop it. That will be a slightly uh, kind of uh, okay disease. Now, this can be, this atopic dermatitis can be a part of atopic diathesis. So usually this is seen in a group of atopic dermatitis, asthma, and allergic rhinitis. So usually uh, children with uh, atopics with 50% uh, of atopics can develop asthma later and around 75% will develop allergic rhinitis. <clears throat> In children also by six months, around 45 to 50 percentage of children will show the signs if at all they are atopic. And by uh, around 50%, 45 to 50% will be showing by six months of age. So, uh, and as you know, this atopy, there is no specific test for atopic dermatitis and it is diagnosed by clinical criteria. There are so many different types of criteria available 
and uh, the most recently followed is a modified Hanifin and Hanifin criteria and the UK criteria. I'm not going to the details of it. Everything is available in the textbooks. Now there are, and this, this uh, as you all know, it is a multifactorial disease. So very strong family history. So genetic uh, role, then the environmental triggers, immunological issues, and epidermal factors. So epidermal factors are very, very important and a very consistent factor in uh, atopic dermatitis is a uh, problem with the epidermal barrier. And there is something called a filagre. It's a protein, actually, filament aggregating protein. That mutation is the most important genetic change which is happening in the atopic dermatitis. And as the patient develops, goes through, the, as, as the, you know, the uh, along the duration of the disease, uh, so many other comorbidities secondary to the atopic dermatitis also will develop like sleep problems, ADHD, depression, anxiety, and the child becomes very, very irritable. So we can actually manage, uh, can actually imagine what the parents are also going through when the child is having a, such a chronic remitting and relapsing problem. So these are the common triggers. You have to educate the patients as well as the parents regarding the triggers because they have to avoid these triggers during the entire uh, maybe it depends on how long the patient is having the disease so a decreased temperature a decreased humidity that is cold dry weather definitely triggers atopic dermatitis and all kinds of irritants like soaps detergents uh, tight fitting dresses woolen dresses and food items. Food items is uh, food allergy is not uh, very common in all atopics. It is around 20 to 30 percent of atopics only will have food allergies. But if a particular the, they are giving a strong history of suggestive of food allergy, then it has to be taken into account. And certain food items are flagged as a uh, potential allergen, like milk and milk products, eggs, seafoods, peanut, wheat, etc. So if you have a, a doubt, it is better to avoid. But there is no blanket um, um, recommendation that you have to uh, uh, you know, avoid all the non veg uh, nothing like that. It all depends on the patients. The parents will very clearly will give you that history. And the potential... <clears throat> Contact allergens, like um, especially the preser preservatives, which we which will be present in uh, many of the topical applications, the fragrances, uh, those things can actually produce a contact allergen, and all these triggers um, will trigger the, an attack of atopic dermatitis. So here you can see uh, atopic dermatitis. Actually, we can uh, divide clinically uh, in an infantile stage, and the childhood uh, stage, and an adult stage. So uh, childhood and uh, adolescent, and they are almost like overlapping uh, uh, picture. But infancy, the picture is a bit different. Uh, so here you can see three pictures. The baby, uh, the baby's face, you can see the uh, <clears throat> a rash on the her cheeks as well as in the forehead. And forehead, uh, I think her uh, mother has put some uh, powder or basmam or something like that. Uh, that's why it's uh, seen as uh, white. Whereas here you can see the red erythematous inflamed skin where the baby will be scratching. You can even see the excoriation marks of the on the abdomen and typically sparing the diaper area. So this is very typical of uh, infantile atopic dermatitis. And here in the leg, you can see a uh, proper oozing has started. So it is going for an acute excess episode. It's going to an acute eczematous stage. You can see that uh, glistening uh, skin with the uh, Crusting, all these crusting are actually dried secretions, which has already dried. And this is the typical oozing uh, kind of eczema this baby is having. So, and usually this infantile stage starts after three months of age because the itch reflex starts only after, uh, I mean, it gets completed only after three months of age. So you will see it, uh, the uh, symptoms will start after, roughly after three months of age. In pediatric age group, you will get some more uh, this thing. Now, what you're seeing here is a follicular papules, uh, slightly hypopigmented follicular papules as a group lesions. You can see the group lesions. This you would have seen this kind of picture in many of these atopic children. They generally have a dry skin. So a general cirrhosis of the skin is very common in uh, atopic children. And some people will have a slightly higher grade of dryness 
uh, amounting to ichthyosis also. Here in this child, you can see there is another uh, finding also called keratosis pilaris, which can also occur in uh, these kind of children, but uh, maybe in an slightly older children and adolescents uh, and adults. They are uh, slightly bigger lesions and uh, they won't be this much grouped as you see in uh, uh, lichen spinulosis. And here in this baby, you can see this uh, very uh, prominent denim organ fold, the extra fold below the lower eyelid. And he has an ichthyotic patch here. And even his body is also very dry, you can see from the picture. And uh, here you can see the two vague white patches. White means hypopigmented patches here as well as here. And it's a very dry patch. You can... Uh, I hope you can appreciate that dryness of the patch. And this is what is called as PTDS's alba. It's a very, very common uh, association of atopic dermatitis. <clears throat> hyperlinearity of palms and soles. So here you can appreciate the hyperlinearity. It's a very, very common finding with uh, in atopic uh, children. Uh, and this is actually a slightly higher grade of ichthyosis. Uh, which is seen associated with the atopic dermatitis. And here you can appreciate uh, because of chronic scratching. See, the children keep on scratching. Even the adults keep on. It's very difficult to control. Uh, even if you tell whatever you tell, it is very difficult to control the uh, scratching sensation. Here you can see because of chronic scratching, the skin has become uh, hyperpigmented. Uh, there is a bit of thickness. That uh, Thickness has increased and there is superficial scaling. So these are all, this is also called a atopic dirty neck sign. Have foot and hand. Hand and foot dermatitis is uh, common in atopics uh, and not, in, well, not much in infants, but more in uh, uh, children and adolescents. You can see typically it affects the uh, dorsal, dorsal aspect. Whereas you can have a combination of contact dermatitis in that picture you will see contact dermatitis features also but this is typically an atopic hand dermatitis the other one which you can see here are small small uh, papules deep seated vesicles uh, this is a highly itchy condition this is called dyshydrotic eczema or palm follicles now palm follicles can occur in different different conditions one of it is atopy in atopy there is a strong association similar things even this palm follicles can occur in the foot as well as food dermatitis also the same. Uh, these two are a bit uncommon. <clears throat> Here you can see uh, where the root of the penis uh, joins with the rest of the skin, there is a fissure. Similarly, here also in the infra-auricular as well as the retro-auricular area, there can be development of fissures. The patient will be scratching a lot. Later, uh, the skin changes occurs and you uh, see a fissure developing in this particular area. These are all seen in atopic kids. Now, atopic chelitis. Again, uh, when the lips become a bit dry, the child keep on licking the lips also. So that saliva also can produce a contact dermatitis. Uh, you can see the difference between these two pictures. This is called perioral dermatitis. This is a bit different from this. Here you can see this entire vermilion border of the lip is involved. You cannot actually differentiate. The dermatitis is actually uh, affecting this border and is merging with the surrounding skin. Whereas here in uh, perioral dermatitis, a bit uh, different. Uh, here the vermilion border is uh, that is preserved and you can see a normal stretch of skin uh, between the lip and the... So here the redness... The eczematous changes, erythema, that, <clears throat> uh, that is seen a bit um, away from the lip margin. Uh, perioral dermatitis, uh, the exact, the, the, there are so many uh, theories about the causation of perioral dermatitis, but that is also seen uh, slightly uh, more associated with uh, atopic dermatitis uh, children, whereas atopic chelitis is more common than perioral dermatitis in atopic children. <laughs> Then the problem of recurrent infections in atopic dermatitis. See, the problem is basically there is a defect in the skin barrier. Now, skin barrier means stratum corneum. Stratum corneum is a homogeneous uh, um, keratin layers, which is the outermost covering of the epidermis. So you have a barrier problem in case of all atopic uh, skin. 
and there is suppression of cutaneous immunity and there is something called a cutaneous antimicrobial peptide they are the things actually which prevents uh, frequent skin infection so they are all at fault and cutaneous dysbiosis that means the there is an imbalance there are normal skin flora and abnormal abnormal skin flora so this balance is actually uh, a bit the balance is lost because of this atopic nature and also this uh, staphylococcus aureus this is a very common uh, this is a bacteria which is very commonly seen on the skin surface but its adherence that uh, adherence of this bacteria to the skin is very much increased in atopics due to various reasons so uh, they are all a bit of more complex i'm not going to those things so just uh, uh, keep in mind there is an in increased adhesion of pathogens to the skin epithelium <clears throat> so you get recurrent infections now in addition to the direct invasion and causing an infection the infective agents can also act, act as allergens so for example staphylococcus aureus toxins a and b and toxic shock syndrome toxin 1 malassezia simpodalis trichophyton rubrum all these things can act as allergens so now what do these allergens do they act as super antigens so as we all know there is a particular pathway for an allergen to cause a immune response whereas in in a simpler word i should tell the super antigens actually bypasses many of these steps so they increase an allergen specific ige ige a damage to the regulator t cell function and they can induce corticosteroid resistance <clears throat> so here you can see a baby usually this is this this is crusted impetigo or uh, and usually we see it around the anterior nares or just uh, by the side of the mouth this is the usual uh, picture whereas here in this child it is almost uh, affecting on one side of the face and here in this picture you can see this is just a miliaria rubra uh, of which the patient has crushed a lot and it has gone for uh impetigenization that is secondary infection so this is out of proportion uh clinical features of a simple skin problem so that is what's happening exaggerated bacterial infection and uh, an uncommon site of infection usually in children and all this is actually tinea of the face tinea infection of the face we call it as tinea facie this is not a very common thing uh, which you see in children Uh, in adults with diabetes or other any other cause of immunosuppression or you may see it but otherwise in children healthy children we don't see it but it is seen in atopic children uh, here you can see very well appreciate the denim organ fold in this child so this is actually including the hairy area the tinea facie and this popliteal area you can see what is this this is actually molluscum contagiosa it is also a very uncommon site uh see the problem is the child keeps on scratching all these viral diseases molluscum or uh, wart verruca all those things they auto inoculate due to the uh, constant scratching or rubbing by the child so you get it in uncommon areas now uh, this is just a word of caution because these are actually complication it's not common at all it is rare but these things can progress to potentially fatal conditions actually eczema herpeticum is something like a generalization of a herp uh, herpes simplex virus infection usually herpes simplex is a very localized mild infection uh, <clears throat> but in case of atopic dermatitis or uh, some other skin disorders also but uh, we will be discussing only with uh, atopic dermatitis the child has a propensity to develop dissemination of herpes so uh, the patient would have had uh, just a localized herpes simplex infection later within few days the patient is becoming uh, i mean developing all systemic uh, symptoms uh, multiple uh, varicella like uh, chicken pox like lesions small fluid fill lesions and is not uh, responding to the not uh, not at all uh, you know responding to the usual lines of management so in this uh, especially when the patient is uh, if he is an atopic you you have to rule out something called an eczema herpeticum this is a generalization same thing uh, eczema coxsackieum for uh, coxsackie virus infection and <clears throat> here actually what we can do is if you have a doubt you can do a sang smear from the small pustule 
this particular picture is already crusted and it has gone for even secondary infection with a bacterial secondary bacterial infection that is further complication uh, so if you do a sand smear with from this blisters uh, small vesicles you will get a multinucleated giant cell or if you have a doubt beyond that if you are not able to you can still go for further uh, uh, investigations like pcr viral culture and things like that but start acyclovir at the correct moment there won't be much problem the problem with this particular disease is late detection so by that time your precious time would have been lost now ocular involvement ocular problems are very common in atopic children because they will constantly scratch their um, they will keep on rubbing their eyelids even recurrent sty is common in this children and recurrent persistent rubbing can cause keratoconus and uh, atopic blepharitis that is um, uh, you know inflammation of the eyelids blepharo conjunctivitis and seasonal and perennial atopic papillary conjunctivitis and cataract cataract is not common but uh, more directly due to atopidermal you can develop anterior subcapsular cataract and posterior as a complication of um, corticosteroid use so here you can see in both this picture you can see that the, here it is redness denim organ fold is seen a mild scaling is there this is even more uh, that edema redness and peeling of skin this is atopic blepharitis so differential diagnosis now uh, differential diagnosis is important now why the problem is many times we won't see it in the correct you know textbook kind of description as uh, professor um, kartikeyan suggested he has pointed out this point of scabies scab dermatitis as well as these two infections can coexist together so when you are managing you have to actually rule out these two things before you start uh, any kind of uh, steroids topical steroids or something like that so you just imagine if you just start a topical steroid over a course, over a uh, plaque of scabies or dermatophytosis so we can rule out scabies by doing a scraping and put it in mineral mineral oil mound or a liquid paraffin mound you will be able to demonstrate the um skybella or the that is excretory material or the eggs possible dermatophytosis just a koch mound will show you the uh, fungal filament so uh, we have to especially when it is a generalized and you are suspecting this kind of generalized uh in, infection or infestation rule it out before starting the specific therapy <clears throat> then uh, uh, psoriasis i'll just show a uh, few pictures and uh, whenever it is not at all responding to the usual line of management we have to think of some immunodeficiency disorders because in biscot aldrich job syndrome and combined immunodeficiency and all the patient presents with generalized eczematous lesions so that is only we can keep it in mind now another term syndrome is a congenital syndrome which is actually associated one of its component is atopic dermatitis it has a peculiar type of uh, ichthyosis uh, called ichthyosis linearis circumflexa which is actually uh, something like a scale is which is attached to the center with the um, we and um, the periphery of the scale will be detached from the skin so a, a particular different kind of uh, ichthyosis you get then the uh, acrodermatitis enteropathica and along with other uh, general deficiency disorders also sometimes can present like this so this is a picture of seborrheic dermatitis here you can see a bit of glazed uh, reddish uh, lesion you can see that uh, this genital is involved it's a bit of dry it is actually a subsiding seborrheic dermatitis that is why it is not that much red and uh, you can see this all the folds you can see the dryness this particular diaper area exclusion uh, involvement will not be seen in atopic dermatitis now flexural psoriasis here you can see <coughs> this also looks like uh, atopic dermatitis but here it is a plaque uh, because it is a flexural area and there is um, moisture there that is why you are not able to appreciate the typical scales of psoriasis but if you have a doubt you can take a biopsy and that will show typical features of psoriasis now investigation there are no specific tests 
diagnosis only by clinical criteria, but uh, some people do certain tests. As such, we don't require a particular test for this. Uh, some people do a total serum uh, immunoglobulin E, which is in, increased in uh, more than 80%. There are, but there are some people in which uh, the, uh, that is negative also, but we don't get any extra information from uh, with the, the severity, course, or prognosis of the disease. But there are some specific allergen, allergen specific IGs are available. Uh, that can also be done. That is to find out a specific allergen for the particular patient. Now, skin prick tests. These are all not routinely done. I'm just mentioning for the sake of postgraduate students. Foot or aeroallergency. Actually, skin prick test is a test to demonstrate the immediate hypersensitivity. Immediate is, is what is actually operating in atopy. Food allergy, again, I told you it is 20 to 30 percent patients only will be having food allergy. So actually, if you want to demonstrate the test is oral food challenge test, again, you have to uh, admit the patient and there are so many paraphernalia associated with it. Allergy patch test, this is mostly we, do, we use it for conduct dermatitis to diagnose which all the patient is allergic to. Again, in atopy dermatitis, it has a poor predict, it doesn't predict much. It is a poorly predictive of trigger, triggering factors. Now we come to the management. Uh, now the problem with, uh, as you all know, the atopy child has always a dry skin. Now this dry skin can directly cause itch. The patient will itch. The patient will have itching sensation and he will start scratching. And finally, that will finally go for eczema. Eczema, once it becomes settles, again, it goes for dry skin. And as a secondary thing, there can be a secondary infection also. Any triggers will stimulate all this the cycle again and again. <clears throat> so, number one, I should feel like before starting any kind of treatment, number one and the foremost one should be patient bar the parent counseling, depending on the age of the child, uh, parent counseling. So they have to be explained about the chronic nature of the disease, exacerbating factors, and they should many times, the, what the parents ask all of us doctors are, whether it will be, it is fully curable. So sometimes I think it is better to talk, uh, better to tell them the truth only to the parents that how much you can, you cannot cure the disease, we can only control it, uh, provided you do so and so things. Okay, the patient can be really free of all the problems if they follow a particular uh, style of uh, skin care regimen. So, <clears throat> and along with this, when the child becomes a bit uh, older and all, no, they have this kind of irrit highly irritable children, behavioral problems, uh, some psychological issues, sleep disturbance, so all this can actually uh, even make the problems worse. So we have to actually address these problems also. So the goals is number one is not to cure, but to control. Sugar should be reduced. And number one, reduce the pruritus. Very, very important. The patient should be symptom free. Otherwise, itch and scratch is a cycle. So if there is an itching sensation, the patient will scratch. The scratching as such will increase the itching sensation. So unless and until we break the cycle, there won't be any uh, improvement in the patient's condition. So that is very, very important. This is uh, A-rated, that is evidence A-rated approaches by American Academy of Dermatology. Moisturizers, topical corticosteroids, topical calcineurin inhibitors, and they are dead against routine use of topical anti-staphylococcal treatments. So topical uh, continuous use of uh, antibiotic creams is not at all advised in atopic dermatitis because it brings about resistance. Skin hydration, these are all the things which we should actually educate the parents. Uh, bathing followed by immediate application of emollient. That is a cornerstone of uh, maintaining the uh, skin in atopic dermatitis. So the water can be just warm, lukewarm. So walking is better than just shower, taking a shower, five to 10 minutes. Actually in small children, we can just put, uh, put them in a tub with water. They actually like playing in water. And uh, regarding soaps, it is better to use uh, <clears throat> low pH, hypoallergenic, fragrance-free, non-soap cleansers. Non-soap cleansers are available. So it is better, especially for atopic children, that is better. And there is no specific advantage for antiseptic soaps. 
And in case where there is extensive, like moderate to severe kind of uh, atopic dermatitis and the child is highly irritable, the skin is very much red and angry looking and small ch children, the wet traps are useful actually. So wet traps before, uh, this also we, you can teach the parents. So number one is actually, first uh, step number one is actually uh, give a bath uh, in warm water, lightly just pat dry and apply steroid that is uh, appropriate steroids to the affected area and uh, emollient to the other normal areas. Then you put the first layer that is mildly warm water. You just dip it in and just wrap it, just cover the area with the wet dressings followed by a dry, something like a pajama and full sleeves uh, shirts. So <clears throat> depending on the uh, condition of the severity of the, uh, of the condition, uh, it can be applied for a few hours or even it can be, if it is very severe, you can do an overnight wrapping also. So around two to three times per week, actually, you can uh, give this. This is going to be very, very useful. It really reduces the itching and oozing. Only thing is, uh, when it is secondarily infected, when it is too much of weeping and crusted, then you better don't use it. Now, bleach bath is uh, actually, this is very useful for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis with recurrent skin infections. <clears throat> now, how to prepare it? This is just a 6% household bleach only. Um, uh, that uh, For per bucket of water, that is 15 liters, you can just put one teaspoon of uh, bleaching powder and just soak the baby, uh, child in that till they can just uh, lie down with the neck and head out. Now, advantages, it reduces the Staphylococcus aureus and MRSA colonization and decreases the severity. So, immediately after bath, we should be uh, applying the moisturizers. Now, there are three types. Uh, if you really go into the moisturizer part, there are three types. One is occlusives. They are actually uh, something like um, petrol atom that is a thick, oily uh, application, which actually forms a barrier uh, just above the stratum corneum layer and it prevents evaporation. And whereas humectants, they are actually agents which actually absorb water from the environment. Examples are glycerin, propylene glycol, urea, etc. And emollients is one which seals the crevices. So a dry skin, immediately after taking bath, apply emollients. So it will seal the crevices uh, between the corneal sites. So all our coconut oil is well uh, and uh, it's very good. Stearic, linolic, linolenic, all these things, palm oils, even sunflower oils, they are all good emollients. And uh, <clears throat> only in children, we don't recommend propylene glycol and urea. So all the other agents you can apply. And in addition to the moisturizing effect, they also have anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, and steroid sparing effects. So it can be coupled with topical corticosteroids. So these are the topical agents. Now, very much, uh, you know, when a, whenever a patient comes to you, we have to first assess the severity. There are so many scoring systems available. I'm not going to those details. But depending, at least mild, moderate, severe. In a clinical setup, we can do that. Uh, so accordingly, according to the severity, you can choose the topical agents. So extensive severe disease, again, we may have to start systemic therapy. Otherwise, localized, um, not much moderate disease, we can uh, choose a topical steroid. So topical corticosteroids can be chosen. Then topical calcineurin inhibitors, that is uh, pimicrolimus 1% cream and tacrolimus 0.03 ointment. 0.1 is mostly reserved for uh, adolescents and adults. And uh, phosphodiesterate 4 inhibitors, crisaborol 2% joint, this is not available in India. And doxepin creams are also available. Doxepin tablets are also available. Creams are also available. Actually, uh, topical doxepin is available. Uh, it is belonging to a tricyclic antidepressant with a very prominent anti-H1 and H2 action. So when you are applying, no, you have to tell uh, the parent how much to apply. For this, we will just uh, you uh, see the fingertip unit measurement. Uh, the index finger, tip of the finger to the first digital crease. That means the distal digital crease. Uh, this is roughly a one finger tip unit and is roughly a 0.5 gram tube. The taking, uh, assuming that the nozzle is 5 mm size diameter, uh, this is actually almost equivalent to two adult palm size. So that much. Now, how much to apply and all, all tablet columns are available in the textbook as well as in the nets. So now the selection on the basis of site. 
very very important so very intertrigenous areas genital areas face and all we we should not be applying um, potent anyway for uh, infants definitely potent uh, steroid creams are out uh, even in children or adolescents adolescents we usually treat just like adults only uh, <clears throat> So in the we have to choose a very low potent or a mid potent steroid for that. And age again, extremes of age, the skin thickness is uh, uh, less. So we have to choose again uh, mild to moderate potent steroids. Frequency of application, they all depending on the condition. Uh, and uh, just keep in mind that monthly use should not because they are all chronic patients should not exceed 15 gram in infants, 30 grams in ch children, and 60 to 90 grams in adolescent or adults. So this is the roughly, that means uh, they should not be using beyond that particular. Now there is something called a pro proactive therapy. Now what is this? Now actually when, when you take an atopic dermatitis patient, there are some affected area, there are some non-affected area. Now when the acute stage is over by appropriate treatment, it comes to the subacute stage, isn't it? So even that time you need a maintenance of therapy. You cannot just stop therapy just like that because this can uh, get exacerbated at any time. So even a normal looking skin in an atopic patient is not normal by structure. They are still, they, it is still having a barrier uh, defect. So you need a long-term low-dose intermittent anti-inflammatory agents to previously affected areas also. So what they will do, they will, uh, you better start with uh, continuous steroid uh, applications. After a few days, maybe 10 days or two weeks will become better. You can reduce the potency of the steroid or the, the frequency of application. And whereas still the rest of the area, you should be applying moisturizers. And when everything becomes uh, normal, still you should be applying moisturizers. When you get uh, again uh, exacerbation, again you have. So that is how it is. So proactive in between attacks, uh, how to manage the skin also should be taught to the patient. Now systemic therapy, uh, as we know, miscellaneous. I'll come to the miscellaneous first. Number one is oral antihistamines. Very very important antihistamines. The patient has to sleep. If they don't sleep, they will keep on scratching, and each scratch cycle gets activated. So that's very very important. And sedating. That's first generation antihistamines. The best for atopic dermatitis. Now systemic antibiotics only if there is a significant skin infections and antivirus, antifungals, everything when it is appropriate. Now regarding the other drugs, you know supplement. So immunosuppressants, uh, we usually go for first, as a first line, we may go for a cortico, um, systemic corticosteroid. That is only to manage an acute exacerbation and the duration should be short. You need not uh, taper and all. Give a just a short course of steroid and immediately stop and just shift to moisturizers and topical steroids. So that is the safest uh, thing. But in certain cases, the atopic dermatitis is very severe. So in that case, you start with this, and along with that, you can go. Um, uh, along with that, you can start the other drugs, that is immunosuppressants, and slowly stop the corticosteroids. So all these things, cyclosporin syrups are available, 2.5 to 5 milligram per kilogram body weight, methotrexate around 3 to 0 0.7, 0 0.3 to 0 0.7 uh, milligram per kilogram body weight per week. So only thing is, all these things, as you know. And needs a proper monitoring, close monitoring should be done. And whenever it is under control, switch over to topicals. Now, phototherapy is very good, actually. Uh, narrowband UVB is available, but it's only reserved for adults. Uh, narrowband UVB for chronic eczemas and UVA1 for um, acute eczemas. Narrowband is very actually very good, but the problem is long-term therapy, because of the safety concern, uh, it is not being given for children. <clears throat> Now, these are the newer agents. Dupilumab is actually, uh, FDA has approved it for adults. And uh, the, um, the last phase trials are uh, going on for more than 12-year-old kids. And it is not uh, all these things. The other, uh, Nimolizumab, Lebricizumab, all these things are under trials. And uh, uh, right now, only Dupilumab. Uh, Oma, Omalizumab is there, which is actually a monoclonal antibody, which is given for a chronic, persistent, very severe kinds of vertic area. Uh, many studies have done, but that is not actually showing much uh, role in the management of atopic dermatitis. Now, topical, this is a boron-based uh, uh, 
uh, chemical uh, chrysaborol it is a phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitors uh, again this this is available F fda approved available in uh, united states not still available in india uh, if at all if it's available it is can be given only about three months of age and uh, ruxolitinib this is also under trial jackins inhibitors tofacitinib is being tried all the others are under trials. These are the new drugs for the benefit of postgraduate students. Uh, oral uh, um, PDA4 inhibitor. The Aprimilast is there in this uh, in the market for quite some time now. We use it for um, mostly for uh, uh, psoriasis along with the co-prescription with other agents for psoriasis. It was also found to um, show certain uh, eff good effects with this Pro probiotics none of the studies are showing uh, that much benefit melatonin uh, is actually regulating sleep and circadian rhythm and it is found to be beneficial as a co-prescription and there are a uh, new allergen specific immunotherapies available but uh, again showing conflicting results no challenges challenges uh, for doctors challenges for uh, the parents so as doctors the problem one thing which we all uh, uh, encounter is a poor adherence to the instructions and drugs from the on on patient side see the problem with this is we may not be aware of this we will think it as a lack of response to whatever drugs we have given and we may unnecessarily escalate the treatments so we have to really talk with the patients uh, parents and uh, motivate them to adhere to the regimen and steroid phobia this is a very very important uh, thing because a, every other patient because of this google uh, uh, internet surfing or whatever uh, they think that steroid is uh, something like a poison uh, which should not be given to kids madam is it steroid this is the first question they ask so again we have to address their their fear is otherwise if they have this fear they will never give a, apply as per our instructions so uh, this apprehensions to irrational fear should be addressed uh in the uh, with the parents and uh, there is always increased susceptibility keep it in that mind and detrimental effect on the quality of life and again behavioral problems irritability embarrassment and social isolation the problems which the child is going to face and just uh just giving a treatment for the skin is definitely not enough we have to address uh, and if necessary take a help uh, in dealing with these problems that is the uh, behavioral problems and psychological problems so uh, atopic dermatitis is a chronic disease with significant impact on quality of life um, social academic the academic performance will be affected and uh, available treatments have to be evaluated because affordability is a big question because many of the uh, drugs are uh, costly a uh, patient may not take it properly and parental and patient counseling is very very critical and one more thing which i would like to highlight is many times it is often it is the itch that rashes rather than the rash that itches so mostly it starts all with itching itching giving to a rash and again it's uh, it's getting scratched and again it becomes a uh, eczema so if you can cut it at the level of itching that is again highlighting itch and scratch cycle antihistamines and a proper soothing uh, applications that will i think uh, will be will be able to address the problem in a better way if you think in that line thanks a lot for uh, giving me this opportunity Thank you, ma'am. The last quote delivered it all. It's the itch that rashes rather than the rash that itches. Thank you so much, ma'am. This is this topic has always been an enigma, both for the exams and for treatment. And you made it uh, appear very easy uh, through your uh, crystal clear presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, just a question. Uh, like you said that uh, the common skin uh, pyrogens, they act as super antigens. But uh, against the use of uh, uh, empirical use of antibiotics to treat them by the American Academy of Dermatology, like uh, is it uh, a dictum or um, kind of uh, an Indian makeup that we can might as well treat those infections also? See, the problem is no. If it is just a superficial infection, yes, definitely we can give it the patient. We need not give a systemic antibiotic to the child we can actually even a soap and water wash is enough 
for that immediately apl apply moisturizers in practice i have always uh, seen this coconut oil has as a very good antiseptic action and it's a very safe thing to apply especially to fluctuations uh because we see a lot of endotrigenous infection in this kind of patients so uh if it is extensive extensive uh, infection definitely we have to go uh, with uh, antibiotic uh, systemic antibiotic but definitely i have just referred many uh, articles they are all uh, telling against uh, the uh, use of regular use of topical antibiotics so i think uh, we also should not be uh, you know contributing to the resistance yeah <laughs> true but what is the difference between how to differentiate between atopic dermatitis and fungal infection in newborn a participant wants to know actually the fungal infection you see mostly in newborn the more commoner fungal fungal infection is a candidiasis not uh, you know uh, com compared to dermatophyte uh, candidiasis candidiasis is more common and candidiasis is very common in the i think uh, dr um, uh, kartikeyan has already shown the slide in the endotrigenous area the neck the endotrigenous area but in the endotrigenous area the candidiasis affects the depth of the fold whereas i have already mentioned the diaper area is always paired in atopic dermatitis and one more thing is atopic dermatitis eczema starts with itching which acts which starts after 3 months of age when the itch reflex starts so before 3 months it's very difficult to see atopic dermatitis very very rare if it is you are seeing lot of eczematous lesions in uh, before 3 months of age think of the immune deficiency syndromes hypergamma globulinemia all those things and again see always there is a method of diagnosis for cutaneous fungal infection take a, a scraping put it under the microscope add a drop of ko and see under the microscope you can always rule out yes ma'am ma'am uh, you said that uh, common viral infections exaggerate uh, ad uh, herpeticum and coxsackium you were uh, yeah. relating to uh, does that mean the, that no no it is not exaggerating ad because of ad because of atopic These dermatitis get... yeah because of atopic dermatitis the viral infections can become systematized disseminated so it's better because that are... we treat even common uh, viral infections in children who are predisposed to ad is that so ma no you need not give uh, routine uh, antivirals are not required in this patient but we should have an eye for that that's yes. all yes see a small uh, group purpose labialis we usually do not treat so we don't the patient doesn't require that but we have to have an eye for that unless and until we think about and preempt it you know and we will never think of a uh, uh, generalized if you have it in mind you will see it when okay. it presents or the mind does not know the eyes do not see Yes, yes yes definitely <laughs> so if we are sensitized we will think about it okay yeah ma'am that was a very good uh, take home point that was delivered well thank you so much ma'am for the thank patience and you. the elaborate discussion thank you ma'am so the next speaker thank for the so day much. thank, thank you ma'am uh, i invite dr deva prabha senior resident officer of dermatology and venereology from government rajaji hospital madurai medical college to deliver her talk on faqs in dermatology she's done her uh, undergraduate and post graduation at uh, madurai medical college she's a very favorite teacher among the post graduates and uh, her fondness among them bears testimony to her teaching um, so she'll cover all the frequently seen uh, cases pediatric cases in the dermatological Uh, department and uh, over to Dr. Deva Prabha, ma'am. Ma'am, good evening, ma'am. Ah, uh, good evening. Ah, uh, my audible, ma'am. Ma yeah, ma'am, you are audible. Okay, ma'am. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, uh in this in the pediatric scene, me. Ma'am, my whether my screen is visible, ma'am. Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. You are audible and your screen is visible. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. My topic for today is frequently asked questions in pediatric dermatology. Sure. Mom, my screen is visible. Mom, your screen is visible. The slides aren't moving. Slides. Yeah. 
Ma'am, one minute. Yeah, no problem. Second screen is there. Madam, screen is there. Ma'am, yes, ma'am. Your screen is visible. The first slide is visible. Slide is visible. Yes, yes, ma'am. Your slide is visible. No, now it's not visible, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Your screen is visible. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Ah, okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, my topic is frequently asked questions in pediatric dermatology. Uh, this is the overview of the skin topics, skin conditions, which I'm going to deal in short. Uh, these are the conditions we are commonly seen in our day-to-day OT. Coming to first condition, pityriasis alba. It's already, madam and sir has already described. I only elaborate a few points. It is a common eczematous dermatosis occurring in children. It is most common during winter. Association with ATOP is present. The clinical features are ill-defined erythematous or hypopigmented patches with fine scales seen. Common sites are face, cheeks and chin. It can also occur in other sites such as neck, shoulders, arms. These are the common differential diagnosis and we have Difficulty in diagnosing in the OP. These are the uh, conditions which confuses us. First, first one is vitiligo. With vitiligo, there will be the clinical presentation is depigmented patch instead of hypopigmented patch. It can occur over any areas in all age groups. Can occur. Coming to uh, indeterminate leprosy, seborrheic dermatitis, tinea vesicular, and tinea fasciae. These are the pictures. I'm going to explain. The picture which is seen on the left is a classical picture of a tinea versicola. Ma'am, am, am I audible? Hello? You're audible, ma'am. You're audible. Okay, Your ma screen is visible. Okay, ma'am. This yes. is the clinical picture of tinea versicola. The clinical morphology is multiple hypopigmented scaly macules, which is present in the perioral region. And also in the perinasal region, we can you can see scaly high, scaly macules and patches over the perioral and perinasal region. It is classically tinea versicolor. We will have doubt whether it is pityriasis alba or tinea versicolor. But in this, we can see perinasal distribution and the consistency. When we palpate the lesion, there will be velvet appearance. And when we, uh, if we want to uh, confirm the diagnosis, as Madam told, we can do KOH. Scraping and do KOH mount and see the hyphae. The second picture is a classical picture of a baby with the skin lesion present over the face. This is a erythematous block with papules shuddered in the borders. In this baby, we have a doubt whether it is tinea fasciae or any other discoid eczema. But on closer view, we can see mild scaling present in the patch and there is a family history of Dermatophyte infection in the mother. We can confirm it by doing scraping. The third one is indeterminate leprosy. There will be hypopigmented patch which is present in the face, uh, but there will be some amount of infiltration will be present on close look. But sensation cannot be tested in early lesion because face have a very rich supply of nerves. So we have to confirm the diagnosis by biopsy. Coming to treatment, uh, topical emollients should be given and mild topical steroids such as desonide hydrocortisone cream can be applied. Coming to second condition, infertigo. This is a condition we, uh, we will commonly encounter in a day-to-day -day OP. Infertigo is a contagious superficial bacterial infection of skin. It occurs in infants and in children. It is mainly caused by Staphylococcus aureus and Streptococcus pyogenes. There are two types. Bullous and non-bullous infertigo. Coming to the picture, 
the left one it is a non bullous sympatico the the classical presentation of the non bullous sympatico mainly consists of the clinical lesion consists of multiple hyperpigmented crested plaques with erosions present over the perinasal perioral over the around the eyes and it few lesions also present in the trunk this is a common site of appearance of non bullous sympatico there will be uh, the diagnosis will be helpful by morphological seeing honeycomb like crest on the surface of lesion the right one picture in this uh, we can see multiple crested blocks with erosions and the borders we can see few bulla and blisters at the borders this this children child has bullous sympatico bullous sympatico is mainly caused by staphylococcus aureus and it is a localized form of sss sss is also caused by staphylococcus aureus ah uh, sss is also caused by staphylococcus aureus but the toxin it is both are toxin mediated in bullous sympatico the staph produces exfoliating toxin which uh, which cleaves the stratum corneum mainly it will uh, cause blister at the level of superficial level so in in both the babies we will have difficulty in diagnosis but the clinical clues which help in diagnosis are in non bullous sympatico it is common around the orifices where staph normally colonizes we can see the skin lesions around the orifices in bullous sympatico also there will be multiple crested block and erosions the baby the child is uh, have few bulla around the lesions uh, coming to diagnosis we will have a differential diagnosis is staphylococcal scarred skin syndrome herpes simplex contact dermatitis chronic bullous disease of childhood we will see one by one coming to this picture sir has already described about the staphylococcal scarred skin syndrome the staphylococcal scarred skin syndrome occurs in infants and children mainly it will present as a tender skin lesions the skin will be tender to touch nikolsky sign will be positive when we touch the skin and give pressure there will be peeling of skin in the peripheral areas and it is the nikolsky sign will be positive the babe the child will be toxic and sick in staphylococcal scarred skin syndrome it will start first in the face and in the flexures we can see superficial blisters and erosions and there will be peeling and whirling or rolling of skin in the borders like potato chip appearance the second picture is herpes labialis this picture we can see grouped vesicles with crested erosions in the lower lip this is a classical site of herpes labialis it will cause difficulty in diagnosis when it is present in the upper lip perinasal area if it is present we will uh, get some more difficulty in diagnosing but herpes labialis we can confirm by doing zank test a simple bedside test and by seeing multinucleated giant cells the third picture is a chronic bullous disease of childhood and this is a bullous disorder which is commonly seen in children we can see bulla and vesicles around the erythematous block this is classical string of pearls appearance the baby will be but in this it is a bullous disorder mainly auto antibodies against uh, collagen type 17 questions uh, most of the mothers will ask whether it is herpes infection no it is not viral it is bacterial infection is it recurrent yes it can occur recurrent because some babies children will colonize staph aureus so recurrent infection occurs and under poor environmental condition poor hygiene it will occur recurrent how to prevent complications early identification early treatment and avoiding any native application of medicine will prevent complications common mix, misconception of patients in our op in our department we will commonly encounter the patients will think us in tamil as sakki and they will apply uh, uh, the uh, they will apply some native medication over that and will come to op with secondary infection baby will be in sepsis so uh, the patient should be educated it is not any viral infection it is only bacterial infection don't apply any neem application or any topical kavi they will paint kavi and come don't apply any topical native medications 
uh, because the child will end up in complications the early treatment we can prevent the complications such as glomerulonephritis and sepsis coming to folliculitis this is on, on one of the another frequent condition we will encounter in the in our op it is a bacterial infection confined to the hair follicle it is caused mostly by staphylococcus aureus in this clinical picture we can see multiple erythematous tender papules and pustules commonly seen over the scalp face and also trunk it is most common we can see during summer precipitating factors are occlusion overhydration excessive mineral oil application or excessive any rampant use of topical steroids non infective cause of folliculitis such as in chemical factories those persons who are working will get folliculitis and it occurs mostly in adults treatment we we should improve local hygiene correct any malnutrition if it is present topical antibiotics for extensive lesions use systemic anticephalococcal antibiotics coming to another top other topic intertrigo madam and sir have give elaborate description about that this is the clinical intertrigo intertrigo is a skin lesion which occurs over the intertriginous folds it commonly occurs in the nape of the neck inframammary regions in the groin in the gluteal region intertri is most common in children because due to maceration and due to the uh, sweating increased sweating it will occur in children in babies we commonly encounter intertrigo because of the uh, frequent drooling of milk in the neck and so we are commonly encounter intertrigenous lesions in the neck this is a classical picture of intertrigo which is present in the groin we can see erythematous scaly block with the matter block with my scaling only we can see satellite lesions in in this patient mostly intertrigos flexures will be involved and the folds will also be involved but in atopic dermatitis the groin region will be mostly the this region will be spared in atopic dermatitis moreover in intertrigo it will be super there will be super added infection with staphylococcus and candida this is a diaper rash which is nowadays we commonly encountered in a op in this condition uh, the diaper rash commonly occurs over the areas which is uh, uh, confined to the diaper bearing areas most commonly seen in the gluteal region in the classical diaper rash the intertrigenous folds are spread we can compare with the previous picture where the folds are involved but in diaper rash the inter folds are spared coming to the treatment intertrigo we should give topical antifungals and antibiotics if any secondary infection present in diaper rash barrier application we should uh, application of zinc oxide and mild topical steroids and we have to look for any super added fungal infection diaper rash is commonly occurs in babies due to increased the children will have increased ph in the diaper bearing area so it is more prone for infection uh, scabies scabies already uh, sir has mentioned so i will uh, quickly uh, give a short description only it is caused by sarcoptes scabies more commonus it occurs predisposing factors are poor hygiene overcrowding children and in no separate individual we get norwegian scabies and mode of spread mostly by direct contact and foamings clinical features the classical lesion present in scabies are burrows burrows are nothing but a linear tract which is present in the epidermis extending from the stratum corneum to stratum alpigae burrows cannot be visualized by normal eyes it can be seen in dermoscopy or any special ink application then we can view by dermoscopy burrows are most commonly seen around the breast and in the web spaces the common sites scabies might launch on the no uh, mainly the areas or the in interdigital spaces the flexor aspect of the breast the inner aspect of the uh, cubital fossa the inner aspect of the axilla breast region umbilical region inner aspect of uh, genital region inner aspect of thigh on joining these points we will get a circle and the circle is known as circle of hebra the scabies might will commonly launch in that areas but in children uh, scabies lesions can occur in face palms and soles but palms and soles is not involved in adult face palms and soles are more involved in infants and children infantile scabies we will see vesicles 
papules and excoriations. And moreover, bullous lesion can also be seen in school going children age group. Another entity is animal scabies. Animal scabies is caused by sarcoptus scabies, war canis. In this, the unusual sites, there will be skin lesions where they co have contact with the pet animals because they will carry the pet animals in the hands. So there will be skin lesions present over the forearm and in the abdomen areas and the periumbilical region. And in the conditions, burrows will be absent. There will be excoriations, papules will be present. Differential diagnosis. There will be uh, most common problem in diagnosing scabies with insect bite reaction. And also uh, another uh, conclusion, uh, confusing one is atopic dermatitis. And another condition is impetigo. We can see in, in uh, this is a classical picture of scabies. We will uh, present multiple particles, excoriations present over the interdriven spaces. There will be uh, insect papules, vesicles, which is present in the both souls. Questions. Whether it is spread among family members, yes, it is spread among close family contact and close above the hostel rooms. At least four hours of contact is, in, is enough to for the spread of scabies. Animal and foamy transmission present or not? Yes, animal and foamy transmission is present and the mite will be present in the foamates, bed sheets and other materials for 48 hours. How long we have to treat the patients? These are the frequent questions they will in inquire. Uh, before that, I will tell a few points about insect bite reaction. Insect bite reaction will occur mainly over exposed regions, but scabies occur mostly over the common sites in the circle of Hebra and other sites. Moreover, atopic dermatitis will commonly occur in the all areas, as Madam mentioned. Impetigo is common around the orifices, where usually staph colonizes. And moreover, there will be no family history in all these conditions. There will be positive family history in scabies. Then coming to papillar and uh, Then treatment. How to treat the patient? In scabies, we have to treat all the family members at the same time. As already Sir had mentioned, uh, already have given a description about the treatment. So available treatments available are topical 5% perimetrin cream. It should be applied below neck to feet, not even uh, uh, leaving any space. We have to apply continuously below neck to feet, thorough application, six to eight hours contact period, and then they should take bath immediately after in the morning. They should also wash the clothes and the bed linens. All family members should apply the antiscabitic treatment on the same day. If the baby has a chance of uh, uh, licking, thumb sucking, we can apply the medicine and we can use any gloves, hot and gloves like that. Breastfeeding mothers, we should uh, ask the mothers to wash the breast before giving breast milk and then reapply. The breastfeeding mothers should be instructed that baby for babies, uh, the contact period can be limited up to few hours. And if it is not treated by the topical treatment, we can give Oral ivermectin, 200 microgram per kilogram body weight, single tablet. The dose is repeated in the next week. We should also ask the uh, parents any history of pet animals. If that is present, the animal should also be treated. Coming to other topic, uh, next topic, papillary urticaria. It is commonly encountered in a, uh, in a OP. Synanum is an insect bite allergy, uh, otherwise known as IBA. It is common between 2 to 10 years of age. It is an acquired hypersensitivity reaction to the insect bite. First, the biting of the insect results in immediate IgA reaction. So, there will be wheel formation with central punctum. The IBA lesions will have wheel erythematous skin lesion with central punctum. It will help and differentiate from the other lesion. Then, on repeated bites, there will be followed by delayed hypersensitivity reaction, which results in itchy papules. Clinical switches or wheels, papules, vesicles, and bulla. It commonly occur over the exposed areas. This is a classical insect bite reaction. We can see papules with central punctum. We can see papules with central punctum. Papules with central punctum. It mostly present over exposed regions, the areas which is not covered by clots. So, 
we can ask history whether uh, which we can ask the history whether it is present only in the exposed region or inside now differential diagnosis it should be differentiated from scabies polyclitis pyoderma and atopic dermatitis insect bite allergy and scabies how to differentiate insect bite allergy it symmetrically over it present symmetrically over the exposed regions scabies over finger webs wrist axilla groin and peri umbilical region papules with central punctum of the classical lesion scabies we, we will see burrows papules and excoriations the family history will be negative but scabies family history will be positive absent dinol variation that be they will still uh, constant itching all the time but scabies nocturnal itch is common treatment coming to treatment in iba usually the parents will be so much uh tends to uh, repeat the baby is getting repeated infection they will ask how long it will be present whether it is any aso whether it is associated with any condition we should first educate the patient about type 2 gay we should uh, educate the parent that it is a hypersensitive reaction pattern of the uh, skin to the insect but they will ask we we use all among um, all the type of mosquito repellents and mosquito then why why it occurs we should tell that it, a uh, single mosquito bite can cause allergic reactions moreover we can see the children coming from abroad for the first time to india they will encounter they will have immediately they will develop insect bite reaction this uh, mainly we should advise the patient to have protective clothing wear full sleeves uh, in the night time and for pruritus control we should give anti histamines and if it is not resolving we can give topical steroids and if any secondary pyodermal lesions present we can give systemic and oral antibiotics and patience is very important we should tell the patient that will be improvement when the child grows because on repeated bites hyposensitization will occur and no lesions will occur when the baby is grown into adolescent period coming to seborrheic dermatitis this is also uh, discussed about uh, previously this is papulous formus disorder in sebaceous glands which area pterygium sporum ovale is in uh, is one of the positive organs It present as a clinical features is erythematous, sharply marginated plaques with greasy looking scales. The scales are adherent, but in psoriasis, the scales are free scales. We can easily the scales when touch, they will tell uh, the scales are falling from the scalp, loose scales. But in seborrheic dermatitis, we we will have greasy looking scales. There are two types: infantile seborrheic dermatitis and seborrheic dermatitis of adults. In uh, coming to infantile seborrheic dermatitis, infantile seborrheic dermatitis, it is asymptomatic. normally we don't have any pruritus early onset it occurs in the mostly in the first 3 to 4 months of age it occurs over the scalp and over the flexures there will be erythematous squamous lesions present when it occurs over the scalp it is known as cradle cap cradle cap we will have yellowish crusted scaly lesions present over the frontal areas and vertex the mother will be very much worried about that we should advise the mother that will be resolved by its own and no specific Uh, measures will be needed and so we should apply oil and remove the crust then mild shampoos can be used it can also occur over the napkin areas and also over the face forehead eyebrows and retro auricular areas differential diagnosis as already mentioned atopic dermatitis psoriasis contact dermatitis and uh, coming to a point of langerhans cell histiocytosis in uh, langerhans cell histiocytosis is mostly encountered in the uh in the infant age group the baby will have um, a severe seborrheic dermatitis of scalp papules vesicles crusted erosions with oozing most commonly present over the retro auricular area we can see a purpuric lesions or some bleeding spots in the post auricular areas it will help in diagnosing us moreover the baby will have systemic symptoms the baby will be somewhat sick A baby will have systemic complaints and history of recurrent pyogenic infections and history of recurrent otitis media will help to differentiate we can take x ray of the skull and we can see osteolytic lesions and we can evaluate but but in that condition seborrheic dermatitis will be severe then candidal intertrigo and diaper dermatitis one of the treatment topical selenium sulfate shampoo and topical zinc pyrethroid shampoo and topical cyclopiroxolamine or ketoconazole cream in severe cases oral antifungals may be given coming to next condition acrodermatitis intrapathica uh, in nowadays we can see uh, very few cases but we can uh, but we already have seen cases in our op uh, acrodermatitis intrapathica is a 
autosomal recessive disorder of zinc deficiency it is a uh, mainly due to mal absorption of zinc from the intestine triad of clinical feature present is diarrhea alopecia perioral and acral eruptions mostly it occurs pre pre term infants are more prone for zinc deficiency because uh, they can't uh, there will be defect in the absorption of zinc from the intestinal epithelium and moreover the zinc stores stores in the baby is less compared to term babies and moreover zinc requirement is more in preterm babies in children the clinical lesions are symmetrical eczematous plaque in perioral acral and acral regions and genital regions there will be delayed wound healing paronychia and alopecia differential diagnosis it should differentiate it from biotin deficiency and seborrheic dermatitis biotin deficiency there will be similar lesions like that of scaly plaque present over the perioral face and acral regions in genital region also we see but there will be the baby will be have features such as uh, seizures ataxia and failure to thrive moreover biotin deficiency will occur yearly in the babies in the first three months of life mainly due to multiple holocorbates deficiency or biotinase deficiency but the biotinase deficiency we should evaluate it for any metabolic acidosis systemic evaluation should be done uh, coming to this this is a picture we see in our op we can see erythematous erythematous scaly plaque present over the acral region in this picture we can see erythematous scaly plaque which is present over the groin involving the folds also coming to next picture very oral distribution and also present over the cheeks in the both axillary region this is a classical picture zinc deficiency treatment for arthrodermatitis enteropathica lifelong supplementation of 3 mg per kg of elemental zinc should be given for acquired deficiency 0.1 to 1 mg per kg of zinc should be given coming to another condition blister beetle dermatitis uh, this is uh, nowadays you are commonly encountering this in op because it is called it is seasonal soon after monsoon it is mostly occur blister beetle dermatitis is caused by beetles of the family melodiae insect the defen uh, the defensive secretion of the uh, on the insect the blistering agent canthiridin is the mainly causative for the irritant contact dermatitis which occurs it is seasonal uh, soon after monsoon the usually the ma mother notices in the child immediately after uh, in the in the awakening in the morning they will tell sudden onset they will tell skin lesion will occur in the children two types of reaction can occur the second reaction it is mainly due to canthiridin and the irritant which causes irritant contact dermatitis and other one is allergic dermatitis lesion most common in the exposed parts but can also occur in the trunk or back what are the this is blister beetle dermatitis we can see a linear distribution of the skin lesion uh, just like we can see any burns or any acid splash we can see in a dip splash pattern in a linear pattern erythematous plaque in a linear pattern the classical pattern will give a clue uh, of blister beetle dermatitis it will uh, treatment will be local steroid topical application of steroids and antibiotics if any secondary infection we should educate the mother it will resolve in few days but continuous in uh, one areas certain areas and certain household all people will get it say any contact with the insect coming to a few words about topical steroids in pediatric practice madam has told about the fingertip units and uh, how to use another i will only elaborate a few points mild and least potent topical steroids are to be used for infants and mid to moderate potent steroids in children least potent steroids are safe for use in flexural areas moreover desonide hydrocortisone cream can be used over the face mumitrizone cream is to be used about 2 years of age creams to be used over the body and face and ointments over the thicker regions like palms and soles in this i will give a few words about creams and ointment what is an ointment an ointment will have a greasy look and will be thicken when you squeeze of the tube the ointment will be thicken and it is difficult spreadability is difficult difficult to spread so it is applied over the palms and soles regions and thickened plaques and over the lightly fed areas but creams 
it is easy we can, uh, when it is a cream based when you squeeze the cream out of the tube we can easily the cream will be come out and the spreadability is more easier in the body so cream can be used for subacute lesions we can use cream and dry lesions we can use for ointments duration of application of steroid is usually for 2 weeks to 4 weeks in case of least potent steroids then we have to taper the potency or change to intermittent application because long term application of topical steroids with result in complications such as atrophy telangiectasia rosacea acne form eruptions hirsutism and other complications so topical steroid use should be uh, properly advised to the patient and counsel to the parents parents adolescent patients have to be counseled about complaints to treatment adverse effects about the long term use this will give a short idea about that hydrocortisone cream and desonate gel are very used can be used about 3 months of age and then fluticasone can be used about 1 year and about 2 years uh, fluxinolone and momitasone ointment is safer and about 12 years we can use clobetasol ointment and fluxinolone cream a uh, few words about newborn skin care uh, usually the newborn uh, skin is 40 to 60 times thinner than the adult skin so uh, care should be uh, good for the skin so what any as uh, any infections and others the, the newborn skin is less hydrated it has will have reduced natural moisturizing factor and, and almost the preterm skin is somewhat more thinner than the term babies there will be impact thermoregulation and increased trans epidermal water loss so increased care should be taken few words about the common asked questions in our op can i bath my baby daily the we uh, mainly need based and dependent on the regional culture and climatic conditions bubble baths and bath additives should be avoided because it increases the skin ph and causes irritation use of a synthetic detergent synthetic will be more will be means more safer soaps tends to damage the epidermal barrier so it is better to avoid soap instead of that liquid cleansers can be used with acidic or neutral ph of preferred can i massage my baby with oil you can uh, massage for a few minute few minutes five ten minutes with oil but and before that they have to wash their hands under uh good uh, clean condition can i apply powder to the baby uh usually asked but i will advise the baby, uh, mother not to use any puffs because by using puff the powder in the face uh, the baby uh, automatically they will ingest that and uh, cause any respiratory infection can i uh, vigorous scrubbing should be avoided first bath delayed until 24 hours preferably mainly need based and dependent based uh then coming to care of a scalp cradle cap is common and we can advise a mother to apply mineral oils just slip it paraffin to the scalp and the crust can be removed easily and hair should be washed twice a week using mild shampoos powder for me baby routine use of powder is not advocated if they said mother should be advised to smear the powder on the hands now then apply with the hands not to apply it in the groins neck arm and leg folds because in that areas more amount of moisture will present and maceration it will result in infection care of diaper area excessive hydration and maceration more common in the diaper area increased ph due to local action of fecal urease is one of the cause so we should advise the patient use moist cloth or cotton ball soaked in lukewarm water to clean the area not to use wet wipes nowadays lot of people are using wet wipes uh, better advise the patient not to use wet wipes because it will cause a diaper dermatitis and irritant dermatitis in the babies uh, diaper change should be frequent every 2 hours in unit and 3 to 4 hours in infant diaper usually we can use mainly cloth cotton cloth diapers and it should be washed in warm water and dried in sunlight thank you thank you so much ma'am uh, thank you so much madam for the wonderful <laughs> talk um each slide was a take home message and you have given us lot of practical tips on uh, newborn and uh, child skin care uh thank you very much madam uh just uh, a question like uh, okay. regarding the treatment of animal scabies in children is it the same concentration of permethrin that has to be used or uh, is it different ma'am ma'am same same topical permethrin and same uh, if it is not as all uh, same topical permethrin should be used but animal ko we should get treatment from the veterinarian yeah uh, uh, okay, okay same, same treatment only ma'am but we okay. should suspect, suspect the parents will told 
no uh, we have no any contact we are uh, keeping the baby in uh, we are away, keeping part yeah. of the so we should ask the patient not to uh, avoid uh, please to avoid animals to handling the handling animals and uh, yeah. avoid animals to be uh, entering into your bedroom and they will always handle Commonly in, inside their yeah, homes. Yeah, that is a very uh, common is, practice uh, these days. This is yes, the main ma'am. reason for getting animals. Keep it stable. Then we are handling, we are bathing the animal, but it is not. We should avoid the animals from entering into our living place and also into the bed. Yes, ma'am. Thank Same you, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, what is the um, commonly uh, commonly uh, advised treatment for uh, this nickel dermatitis or contact dermatitis? Ah, uh, nickel children? dermatitis, contact dermatitis. We should ask whether. Uh, what are the common sites we learn today? Mostly nickel dermatitis we encounter nowadays are from the uh, any artificial jewellery and the watch strap under that any safety pins on uh, uh, that areas we will encounter nickel. But constant uh, uh, we should ask the patient to avoid. But we should ask avoid that objects only. If persistent or present, we can use topical steroids. Steroid. Okay, depending on the because age. Instead of dial by uh, strap watches can be used. Because in the metal watches, we get allergy. So we can advise to that. And my leather belts, if any allergy. Okay, ma'am. Avoidance of the instigating. Uh, um, avoid exposure to anything. Thank you so much, ma'am. All this uh, beetle uh, dermatitis, all that, that was even new to us, but uh, still uh -huh. it is common in many parts of uh -huh. our uh, state. Thank you so Please. much, ma'am. It was very practical you, and very you. useful. And thanks for making it very illuminating. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Um, and to end, uh, that was the last topic for today's CME. And I thank all the speakers uh, and all the uh, the audience for uh, waiting patiently until the end, uh, because uh, dermatology is always uh, a very very elaborate uh, topic. And however many times we uh, tend to go across uh, go across it, we lose track that is the uh, usual <laughs> mode so uh, our speakers today have made it very elaborative very crisp and uh, informative uh, i thank one and all uh, once again uh, and the office bearers of iap tamil nadu for having uh, given this opportunity uh, thank you one and all and thanks to the audience thank you ma'am thank you we'll end the cme